I'm Finnegan, but everyone calls me Finn. I live out in the Missouri Boonies, right outside the tiny town of Willow Creek. Some folks might find it lonely, but I like it. It's quiet. Besides, Willow Creek has everything I need, the general store, the post office, a bar, that's really about it. It's small enough that gossip spreads like wildfire, which is why I wasn't surprised when the whole town was abuzz over the missing hikers. Two college kids, a guy and a girl, vanished into thin air while camping up in the Ozark National Forest. The whole area's been lousy with search parties, and everyone has a theory. Accident? Foul play? Maybe they even got lost and stumbled onto some meth cook's property. Who knows? My buddy Kellen, him and I go way back. He works at the sheriff's department. Always knows all the juicy details. He swears up and down the hikers are probably just dead somewhere. But I'm not so sure. I've heard stories, whispers passed down through generations, about things lurking in those woods things, not quite human. See, I've been hunting out there since I was old enough to hold a rifle. It's just something you do around here. You grow up knowing that forest, even with its beauty, holds secrets. That there's a line you maybe shouldn't cross. Sometimes I'd find strange things deep in the hills, animal carcasses gutted and hung with unsettling precision or circles of flattened mushrooms in the middle of nowhere. Never saw anything, but it always made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. So when the hikers disappeared, that old, uneasy feeling settled in my gut. It got worse a few nights ago. Couldn't sleep, so I decided to go for a late drive. You know, clear my head, maybe catch a glimpse of the northern lights. They'd been pretty active lately. I was cruising down the old county road, windows down, just me and the crickets. That's when I saw it. Just past the tree line, this tall, gangly figure standing stock still in the field. At first, I thought it was a scarecrow, but it was too big. Way too big. As I got closer, it shifted slightly, and my headlights caught its eyes. They glowed in the dark this unearthly green color, like nothing I'd ever seen. Before I could do anything, the damn thing took off running, faster than any man or animal has a right to move. It vanished into the trees with these long, unnatural strides. I bolted, heart pounding so hard I thought it might burst out of my chest. Back at my place, I drank a whole bottle of whiskey trying to calm down. Even now, with the sun blazing, I'm still shaken. The rational part of me says it was maybe some poacher, or some lanky dude in a weird costume. But I know what I saw. Those eyes, they weren't right. Over the next few days, I kept my head down. Willow Creek is small, but the forest is vast. I figured whatever it was, it had moved on, or was just keeping to itself. But I was wrong. Yesterday evening, Kellen came by. Turns out, while he was out with a search party up in the hills, they found something peculiar the remains of one of the college kids. He looked like he'd been torn apart. Kellen said it was probably a mountain lion, but I'm not buying it. I know those woods. That wasn't a mountain lion. Suddenly, every creak in my house sets me on edge. Every sound of the wind through the trees makes me think of that night. That thing. I'm loading up the truck tonight. Gonna go stay with my cousin in Kansas for a bit, just until things die down hopefully. But I ain't sure I want to come back. Ever since that night, a part of me feels like something dark has a hold on Willow Creek and it's only a matter of time until it turns its attention back to me. I glance nervously out my kitchen window. The tree line seems to loom closer now, shadows deepening with the setting sun. I hear a sharp crack, 
like a branch snapping in the distance, and something that sounds suspiciously like a scream. It cut through my thoughts and sent ice down my spine. Kellen! I bolt out the back door, gun held tight, and race into the woods in the direction of his yelling. It's pitch black, but I know this patch of the forest like the back of my hand. Still, my flashlight beam jitters, snagging on every branch and shadow. My mind races with horrible images. That thing back? Did it get him? I burst into a clearing, and there he is. Kellen's on the ground, a gash running down his leg. He looks terrified, eyes wide as saucers. Finn, behind you! I whirl around just in time. The creature bursts from the trees, all spindly limbs and glowing green eyes. It's bigger than I remember, at least eight feet tall. Snarling, it lunges. I fire, and the creature staggers but doesn't go down. Fear washes over me. What in the hell is this thing? Kellen scrambles to his feet, and together we make a run for it. Adrenaline surges through me. We weave through the trees, the creature's heavy thuds at our backs. It's gaining on us. I swear, the damn thing almost laughs, this rasping, guttural sound. Suddenly, Kellen trips. I yell for him to get up but he's clutching his leg, face twisted in pain. Before I can haul him up, the monster's there. It's a whirlwind of claws and teeth, and the air fills with Kellen's screams. I fire blindly, but it's no use. It's over in seconds. He's gone, and I'm running for my life. I don't stop until I reach the old logging road. Then I collapse, gasping for breath. I don't know how long I lie there. When I finally look up, the first rays of dawn paint the sky. I stagger back as far as town, heart pounding, body racked with sobs. I never speak about that night to anyone. Official report? Animal attack, bear maybe. No one would ever believe me anyway. I don't even know if I fully believe it myself. It seems like a nightmare but I can't forget the image of the creature or Kellen's screams. They echo in my head, a constant reminder of what's lurking out there. A month later, I left Willow Creek. Couldn't stay. Every shadow, every rustle sends shivers down my spine. Sometimes, out on the empty highway, I'll see something tall and lanky slip into a field at dusk and I'll swear those green eyes gleam at me for a split second. But people think I'm crazy, or grieving, or both. Maybe I am. All I know is, the stories my grandpa told me as a kid, the ones I always figured were just old wives' tales, well, those stories took on a whole new meaning. They started to feel a hell of a lot scarier, and a lot more real. Folks around here call that creature in the woods all sorts of names a hide behind, a wendigo. Me? I never learned its name, and I don't want to. What I do know is something evil is out there, hiding in plain sight. And for the sake of everyone in that town, I hope it never decides to come back for seconds. I spent that last summer in Northern California, just south of Oregon, helping out my cousin, Arden, on her ranch. She raises cattle and goats, plus a few pigs, chickens, and one truly horrifying turkey named Tom that thinks he's a guard dog. It's hard work, but I love it out there. The quiet, wide-open spaces, and being able to just breathe without tasting city exhaust— it's exactly what I needed after a long, stressful year. Plus, being a ranch hand was the best way to get back in shape after months of sitting on my butt. The place is about an hour from the nearest little town, and honestly, it takes me that long to walk the full loop around her property. 
Most of the terrain is fairly flat grassland, but there's a thick stretch of woods in the far northwest corner that borders the national forest land. Those woods are where things started to get weird. It began with the goats. One morning, I went out to the barn and found their pen in disarray. Now, goats are escape artists to begin with, but this was different. The fence posts looked like something had snapped them in half. Some of the goats were skittish, but physically unharmed. Others weren't so lucky. There were three missing, and one badly mauled. Arden patched up the goat as best she could, but it was touch and go. I helped her reinforce the pen, figuring maybe a mountain lion or bobcat was getting desperate. Still, something felt off. That same nagging sense of wrongness was gnawing at me, like when you get the feeling you're being watched. A few days went by without incident, which almost made it worse, the tense waiting. Then came the night I'll never forget. I was sitting outside on the porch with Arden and her husband, Ryland. We'd finished dinner, cracking open a few beers and enjoying the sunset. You get the most spectacular views out there, the whole western sky blazing orange and red. But that evening, something felt different. Ryland must have sensed it too, because he stopped talking mid-sentence. You hear that? he said. Arden frowned. Hear what? I listened harder. There was the wind, the crickets, and an unfamiliar sound. A sort of raspy breathing, like an animal struggling with a bad cough. But it was big, and way too close to the house. I got to my feet, my half-drunk beer forgotten. Arden and Ryland followed suit. Sounds like it's coming from the woods, Arden said softly. I nodded, reaching for the flashlight Ryland kept by the door. Maybe it's that goat, I said, trying to sound calm despite the goosebumps on my arms. The one that got hurt. Let's check it out, Ryland said, shouldering his rifle. Arden looked between us, concerned. You sure that's wise? Ryland flashed a grim grin. Don't worry, honey. I'll keep you two safe. We made our way slowly towards the tree line. That damn breathing sound was getting louder, closer. It sounded almost wet. Then, I picked up another scent, metallic and tangy. My stomach clenched up. That's blood, I whispered. Arden and Ryland exchanged a glance. Then Ryland raised his rifle and flicked on his own flashlight. The beam cut into the darkness where the woods began. And that was when we saw it. At first, I couldn't make sense of the shape. It was huge, easily six feet tall even when hunched over. Long, gangly limbs, I thought it was some kind of ape at first, but the way it moved... It was all wrong. Jerky, unnatural. The flashlight beam hit its face, and I nearly dropped my own light. It was long and gaunt, and furless. Or maybe the fur was so slicked down with something wet, it just looked hairless. The eyes were huge and dark, reflecting back the light. But the worst thing, the thing that still haunts my nightmares, was the mouth. It was huge, the jaw unhinged like a snake's, dripping with saliva. And inside I could see rows of jagged, blood-stained teeth. Oh my God! Arden said with a gasp. My breath felt stuck in my throat. That, that thing was looking right at us. Then, it let out a sound I can only describe as a cross between a screech and a roar. The stench of it hit us carrion and something chemical. We didn't wait for a second invitation. We turned and ran, the sound of its claws tearing through the ground behind us. I swear I felt its hot, foul breath on the back of my neck. Ryland fired back, shouting at us to get in the house. Somehow we made it. Slamming the door shut, we could hear it slam against the wood, 
snarls and scratches ripping through the night. Upstairs, Arden yelled. We stumbled up to the second floor, barricading ourselves in her bedroom. I could hear Ryland talking into the phone, his voice shaky. My whole body was trembling. The cops, Ryland said after a minute, they're on the way, but they're way out. Arden, he hesitated. I'm gonna go back down. Try and dash. No. Arden grabbed his arm. You'll get yourself killed. I gotta slow that thing down, he argued. Give you two time. I can handle it. Then there was a crash from below. A blood-curdling shriek that cut off abruptly. My heart dropped into my stomach. Arden screamed, collapsing to the floor, sobbing. I stayed there on the floor with her for hours. The thing, whatever it was, didn't break in. But the whole time, I could hear it moving around outside. That low breathing, the scrabbling of claws, I knew it was waiting. It knew we were trapped. Finally, as the sun started to rise, the noises faded. I cautiously went to the window. It was gone. Just like that, the woods looked normal again. Like nothing had ever happened. It left me feeling hollowed out. The police arrived later that morning, a whole troop of them. They scoured the woods, questioned us for hours, but found nothing. No tracks, no fur, no body. No sign of Ryland. They put it down to a bear attack. Or maybe he'd just taken off. Arden was a wreck. I stayed up there with her as long as I could. But after a few weeks, I had to face it. I couldn't fix this. There were just some horrors the cops, the doctors, no one could protect you from. So I got on the bus back to the city and I left that place behind. But I'll never forget that summer. Or the thing I saw in those woods. Sometimes, driving in my car, passing between dark lines of trees, I swear I can smell it again. That hot, rotten breath on my skin, and the sight of those dead eyes reflecting in the dark. I lived for three years in Billings, Montana, and that time was the best three years of my life. I'm Gerhardt, by the way. After leaving Billings, I took some odd jobs, but nothing serious. I ended up just driving across the country with no destination in mind. When I got tired, I'd find a random town and pull over to get some sleep and I got real good at sleeping in my truck. One day I ended up in a small place called Gold Hill, Oregon. I pulled into a gas station right in the middle of town to fill up and use the restroom. The place was so tiny there wasn't any chain gas stations, just a small mom and pop type place. The lady running the place, she looked about 70 years old and was the nicest person I had ever met. We chatted for a while and it got onto the topic of lodging. There weren't any hotels in town, but she said she had a spare room in her house and would happily rent it out to me for a real fair price. So I took her up on it. Gold Hill was a former gold mining town, but that dried up a long time ago. From what I could tell, there were maybe 100 people that still lived there. They had a small general store, a diner, and a tavern. It was kind of strange being the new guy in a place like that where everyone knows everyone, but after some time, they welcomed me as one of their own. Every Friday I'd head down to the tavern and meet up with some of the locals for poker night. The guys I played with were all pretty rough-looking characters, but they were a lot of fun. There was Silas, a huge bearded fellow who had worked as a logger his whole life and was pretty much known as the strong man of the town. Brant was a cowboy type that ran one of the few remaining ranches outside of town. And rounding out the poker crew was Caleb, 
an older fellow with a real bad gambling addiction, but he was always good for a laugh. After I'd been in Gold Hill for about three months, things started to get strange. First it was a few chickens that were reported missing, then a couple of goats vanished from a nearby farm. The ranchers started to get nervous thinking there may be a coyote, or maybe even a mountain lion sneaking around. That's when Silas and Brant decided to take action. They planned to set up a perimeter around town and head up into the hills to do some hunting. They invited me out, but I'm not really a big hunter and passed on their offer. A few days later, I was heading into the general store when I bumped into Brant. He was standing by the bulletin board looking upset, staring intensely at something tacked onto it. I joined him and saw that it was a missing person poster. The picture was of Caleb. He hadn't shown up for the weekly poker game. We got to talking and he said Silas hadn't returned either. Nobody had seen him since he left with Brand to go hunting a few days prior. Now Brand was real worried about his friend and he started to think maybe they ran into more than just an animal out in those hills. The general vibe at the tavern that night was real somber. It was just the two of us. Hey, Gerhardt, Brand mumbled into his beer. There's something real strange going on around here and I don't know what to make of it. I listened intently as Brandt filled me in on some odd occurrences locals talked about in hushed conversations. It seemed that strange disappearances like this weren't a new thing in Gold Hill. Over the years, there had been reports of people vanishing, but never two at the same time. Do you guys have any ideas? I asked him. He took a long pull from his beer and just shook his head. We don't have a clue. I'm thinking Silas and Caleb got lost up in the hills, but something in the back of my mind tells me there's more to this. It was getting close to dark, and Brand suggested we head out to his ranch and grab his supplies for another hunting trip. He had a bad feeling about this. We got into his pickup and left the tavern, headed for his ranch a few miles outside of town. The dirt road leading up to his property was long and bumpy. It snaked through the foothills, trees crowding in from both sides. The sun was setting and it cast a strange light that made the whole forest look ominous and foreboding. The headlights cut through the increasing darkness and I looked ahead nervously. I saw something moving fast through the trees, keeping pace with the truck. I thought it was a deer or something at first but it suddenly seemed way too big for that. Brand, did you see that? I nudged him, breaking the tense silence. See what? He glanced at me then back at the road, squinting. We kept driving in silence, the headlights cutting feebly into the gloom ahead. I thought I saw something back there in the trees. It moved fast, like it was keeping up with the truck. I tried to sound casual but I still felt uneasy. Brandt shrugged and turned up the radio. I looked back, trying to peer around the trees, but I couldn't make anything out. The feeling of being watched was getting stronger, though. My stomach was starting to twist into knots, and I kept glancing back nervously as I saw dark shapes dancing at the periphery of my vision. Suddenly, something shot out from the brush and darted in front of us. Brandt slammed on the brakes, swerving hard, and we nearly ran headfirst off the road. My heart was in my throat. Jesus Christ, what the hell was that? Brandt shouted, his hands shaking on the wheel. I blinked hard a few times and my eyes focused. There in front of us, illuminated by the headlights of the truck, it stood. It had legs like a man but the body looked hunched and twisted. Thick, dark fur covered its body, and there were no clothes on its frame. Its arms were long and spindly, hanging at its sides, ending in what looked like claws instead of hands. I stared directly into its face, and the sight made my blood run cold. 
It looked sort of human except for the elongated snout and the eyes. Oh, God, the eyes. They were huge and wide, glowing red like burning coals in the half-light. The thing tilted its head and stared back at us, unflinching, as if it was studying its prey. A low snarl rumbled from deep within its chest. Brandt reached into the glove box and grabbed out a pistol, but we both froze as we heard something scraping and scratching against the roof of the truck. That inhuman creature leaped off the road and disappeared into the undergrowth, vanishing as if it was never there in the first place. Brandt was holding his gun, shaking, staring wide-eyed at the spot where the creature disappeared. What? What the hell was that? I... I don't know. My voice barely came out as a stammer. But we got to get the hell out of here. We were both silent the rest of the way to Brant's place. He looked pale, breathing heavily as if he was on the verge of panic. We gathered our supplies and headed back towards town in a tense silence. As we approached the first few houses of town, Brand abruptly pulled over, jamming the truck into park. Gerhardt, we need to tell the town. Warn everyone. His voice was strained, barely above a whisper. I agree. But about what? What are we gonna tell them? It sounds crazy, I said, my voice shaking. I know, I know. But we can't sit on this. Whatever that thing was, it's dangerous. We gotta warn people. Maybe someone else has seen it too. Brand pleaded. And that's when it hit me. That feeling I had of being watched. The creeping unease whenever I walked back to my room late at night. What if that creature had been stalking us all this time? I shuddered at the thought. Brandt and I sped towards the center of town where the tavern stood. We skidded to a halt in the parking lot, jumping out and slamming the doors behind us. The usual chatter and laughter coming from the tavern was replaced by worried whispers as the townsfolk who were there noticed our panicked arrival. Brandt wasted no time filling them in on what we saw, his voice raised as he described the creature out in the darkness. Some were skeptical, others seemed genuinely terrified. I watched as one of the older locals, a stern-faced man named Henry, shook his head and gave us a grim look. That sounds mighty like the Rothram, he said, his voice low. The what? I asked, confused. The Rothram, it's an old tale. A beast that lives deep in these hills, comes out only in the darkness to stalk and hunt, preying on those who are alone. Henry's words sent chills down my spine. My gaze swept across the faces around me. Most folks stared at Henry with wide eyes others with uncertainty. I couldn't help but think back to those disappearances Brand had mentioned, the ones whispered about over the years. Could this creature, whatever it was, really be responsible? All right, enough chatter. We gotta figure out what to do about this. Brand's gruff voice cut through the tension as he gathered the townsfolk around him. He started throwing out ideas like forming a hunting party to track the thing down, setting out traps, or alerting the sheriff in the next county over. The group broke into smaller discussions, everyone debating the best course of action. After a while, the general consensus was to keep a close watch all night and then in the morning, get a group together to search the hills with the sheriff. I noticed Henry slip away during the planning, a frown on his face. The rest of the night was tense and uneasy. We armed ourselves with whatever we could find, shotguns, rifles, even pitchforks and shovels. I settled in with a group keeping watch near the main road watching the tree line. The long hours of darkness dragged on, and my nerves were on edge, my eyes playing tricks on me. Every rustling branch, every snap of a twig made me jump. Just when I started to think this whole thing might have been a mistake, that maybe we had just seen a mountain lion or a bear, 
I saw something move. It was just a flash out of the corner of my eye, but I was certain this time. There, just on the edge of the darkness, was that same hulking form. My heart pounded in my chest and I shouted out, pointing towards the trees. Over there! I see it! Chaos erupted. Shots rang out, piercing the stillness of the night. Panic took over. Some scattered for cover, while others tried to get a better shot at the creature. I squinted through the darkness, trying to make out the creature through the trees. Then it lunged. The Rothram was blindingly fast. It darted in and out of the shadows making it almost impossible to get a clear shot. It swiped at the crowd, slashing at anyone who came within its reach with its powerful claws. I heard a scream cut through the confusion, followed by a sickening squelch. My eyes landed on a figure lying on the ground, a dark pool spreading quickly beneath them. Fear turned to anger, and I charged towards the creature, shotgun raised. I was determined to bring this thing down. I fired wildly, more out of desperation than anything else, praying a stray shot would hit. The Rothram seemed unharmed, but it paused its assault and looked at me with its blazing red eyes momentarily confused. Brant suddenly appeared next to me. Get back! Get to cover! He shoved me towards a nearby tree and aimed his rifle at the creature. I scrambled behind the tree as he fired off several shots in a calculated manner. There was a deafening roar and the creature faltered. That pause was all Bran needed. He reloaded with lightning speed, took aim, and fired again right into the creature's chest. One of the shots must have made its mark. It howled in pain, stumbled, then collapsed to the ground. The whole town was quiet. We hesitantly moved from our hiding spots towards the creature. It was dead. The townsfolk looked shocked, relieved, and a bit confused all at the same time. As we examined the creature up close, it looked even weirder than it did from a distance. The body was covered in that thick, dark fur and its teeth were long and sharp, like a wolf's. Its hands, they looked almost human, only twisted and gnarled. One thing was for sure, this wasn't any beast I had ever seen or heard of. Word spread quickly and the sheriff arrived the next day along with some reinforcements, park rangers and wildlife officers. They inspected the Rothram's body, snapping pictures and taking notes. But they were all at a loss. Nobody could identify the creature. News teams began to descend on the town, turning our quiet existence upside down. Theories circulated. A genetic experiment gone wrong, an undiscovered species, or even something supernatural. But none of those explanations felt quite right. The disappearances in Goldville ended after that night, and life slowly returned to a semblance of normalcy. The memory of the Rothram started to feel like some sort of twisted nightmare, although I still carry it with me. I stayed in Gold Hill for a while longer, but eventually, the open road started calling my name again. And so, I left, carrying the story of the Rothram with me. No matter where I go, no matter who I tell this tale to, I always get the same skeptical glances and disbelieving laughs. But I know what I saw we all do. And maybe that's how the Rothram wanted it, to lurk in the corners of our memory, fading into the realm of legend. I grew up in southern Oregon a little town called Grants Pass. Everyone knows everyone, and if they don't, well, chances are they know your cousin twice removed. You get that kind of closeness in a small place. I spent my childhood running around the woods, building tree forts so dodgy they probably would have gotten condemned if a building inspector ever stumbled on them, and fishing in the Rogue River. 
It was a damn good childhood. Life went on. I got older, went to college, bounced around a couple of different states, and even did a few years abroad. But when my dad passed away last summer, I ended up moving back to my hometown. Mom needed some help, and honestly, I couldn't imagine her in that big old family house all alone. I've been back for a few months now. Mom seems happier, and I've reconnected with a bunch of old friends, Elias, Brecken, and Tilly. Tilly works down at the pharmacy and Elias and Brecken are both volunteer firefighters. Brecken's got this big, goofball black lad named Bear, and the three of us take him hiking in the woods almost every weekend. We were pretty far out last Sunday, hitting one of the trails that wind back into the Siskius. It's dense, old-growth forest, and even though I had been out there a hundred times as a kid, I don't think I'd ever ventured this particular route. Bear was bouncing around with that Labrador energy, snuffling every bush and tree, tongue lolling out in a happy grin. The sun started dipping below the trees and I glanced at my phone, almost five o'clock. Damn, time had gotten away from us. Guys, we gotta turn back if we wanna get out of here before dark. I called out to the others, who were a bit ahead of me on the trail. Brecken grumbled something under his breath. He'd been hoping to reach that old abandoned cabin he always talks about. I guess it's some half-baked plan of his to get a bunch of guys together and fix the place up. We started heading back, and it's not like I was scared of the dark or anything. I've camped out on my own enough times. But something about those woods, so thick and silent, there's a heaviness to the shadows as they lengthen, a sort of hushed feeling, like you've wandered into a place where you don't belong. Gives me the prickles, I swear. Maybe half an hour later, as dusk was really starting to settle in, I noticed Bear was acting funny. His tail wasn't wagging anymore, but tucked low, and his ears were perked up, swiveling back and forth. Easy, boy, what's got you spooked? Elias reached out to pat Bear's flank, but the dog just whimpered, his eyes darting into the trees. Think he caught a scent of something? Tilly said, sounding a little nervous. Mountain lions weren't unheard of around here, though they mostly avoided people. Then we heard it, a growl, low and guttural. Bear whined and pressed himself against Brecken's legs. I felt the hair stand up on the back of my neck. That didn't sound like any cougar I'd ever heard. We gotta get out of here, I said, my voice a little tighter than I liked. We took off down the trail, picking up the pace. I kept glancing over my shoulder, expecting to see a pair of glowing eyes fixed on us in the gathering gloom. We could still hear the growling off in the trees, sometimes closer, sometimes fading. After a good fifteen minutes of hustling, the trail took a bend, and there in front of us was a clearing. There was an old, ramshackle shack nestled among the trees, its clabbered siding peeling, and the roof partially collapsed. No lights on, no sign of anyone around. Thank God. The cabin! Brecken exclaimed. We can hole up there till daylight. It wasn't exactly ideal, but with whatever was stalking us out in the woods, it seemed like the lesser of two evils. We scrambled towards it, me and Brecken practically yanking the warped door open. The inside was musty and full of cobwebs, and there were holes in the floorboards big enough to put your foot through. Still, it had walls and a roof and that felt a whole lot better than being outside. Brecken and Elias started barricading the door with some old broken furniture, while Tilly and I peered out the grimy windows. We couldn't see anything, but the growling had gotten closer. I could make out the crunch of leaves, and something about the sound. It was too heavy, the footfalls too uneven for a cat. I turned back to the others. Okay, so here's the plan. I started, 
hoping my voice sounded more confident than I felt. Elias cut me off. Wait, listen, he whispered. We froze. There was another sound mixed in with the growling, a wet, snuffling noise, and something that sounded like chewing. I swallowed, my stomach starting to churn. Whatever was out there was eating. Tilly, call it in, I said, handing her my phone. I wasn't sure if we'd even get a signal out here, but we had to try. No bars, she said after a moment, her voice trembling. Guys, I think we're screwed. Before anyone could respond, we heard a crash, followed by a howl of pain. Brecken had managed to rig up an alarm system of sorts. A bunch of cans tied together with string, attached to the door handle. If anything tried to come in, we'd know. But from the sound of that yelp, whatever was outside was big and strong. A shadow crossed one of the windows, massive and misshapen. It was on two legs, but hunched over, its gait loping and strange. I strained my eyes, trying to make out details, but the twilight had deepened into near darkness. Whatever it was, it circled the cabin, its growls reverberating through the thin walls. We huddled together in the center of the room, bare whimpering softly. I fished out my pocket knife, not much of a weapon, but it was better than nothing. Elias was clutching a rusty tire iron he must have found in a corner. The banging started a little while later. Each thud shook the whole shack. The growls grew louder, turning into furious snarls. It was trying to break in. We couldn't stay there forever. I locked eyes with Elias and nodded. This was stupid, probably suicidal, but we had to at least try to make a run for it. We eased the barricade away from the door as quietly as we could. I turned to Tilly and Brecken, my heart pounding. Ready? I mouthed, barely daring to breathe the word. They both nodded, their faces pale. I yanked the door open and we rushed outside. It was a full moon, casting everything in a silvery glow. We broke into a run, scattering in different directions, hoping to confuse whatever the hell was after us. I could hear crashing and snarling in the trees to my left. Was it following me? Brecken? I didn't dare look back. I stumbled over a tree root and went sprawling, my hands scraping against the rough ground. I scrambled to my feet just as a huge, dark shape burst out of the trees right in front of me. I froze, my breath catching in my throat. In the moonlight, I could see it clearly. It stood at least seven feet tall, its body a grotesque mix of human and something else. Fur matted its shoulders and thick callous feet. Its head was large, almost canine, but the mouth was too wide, filled with rows of jagged teeth. Its eyes were what got me, though. They were pure black, no whites or irises just those inky orbs staring at me with a chilling intensity. Panic surged through me, giving me a sudden burst of adrenaline. I pivoted and sprinted, my lungs burning with the effort. The thing roared and gave chase, its strides massive, closing in on me with terrifying speed. My heart throbbed in my ears, drowning out all other sounds except its heavy footfalls and the rasping of its breath. I could see the edge of the clearing where the trail continued. Maybe if I could just make it back to the main path. A hand shot out of the darkness and grabbed my ankle. I yelped and crashed to the ground again, pain exploding up my leg. The creature was on me in an instant, its weight pinning me down, its rank breath hot on my face. I thrashed uselessly, but it was too strong. Its claws dug into my arm, drawing blood, and I screamed. Suddenly, a blur of black fur shot past me. Bear lunged at the creature, snapping and snarling. It snarled back, momentarily distracted. That gave me enough time. 
I scrambled and kicked, finally managing to break free. I bolted toward the trees, not looking back, just focusing on putting as much space between me and that thing as possible. I don't know how long I ran. My chest felt like it was going to explode, and I tasted blood in my mouth. But I kept going, driven by pure terror. I stumbled and fell multiple times, tearing my clothes and scraping my skin, barely even registering the pain. Finally, I burst out of the trees, back onto the main trail. I didn't know how far I'd come, but I didn't stop. I kept running, praying for a sign of civilization, a road, a car, anything. After what felt like forever, I saw the lights of a small gas station up ahead. I sprinted the remaining distance, collapsing against the front window, gasping for breath. The man inside the station, a grizzled old guy named Pete, jumped a foot when he saw me. Holy what in the hell happened to you? he asked, unlocking the door and helping me inside. He guided me over to a beat-up old armchair and handed me a bottle of water. I gulped the water down, trying to get my breath back. My whole body shook, and I couldn't stop the tears that spilled over at the sight of another human being who wasn't. Well, whatever that thing back in the woods was. Pete waited patiently, just giving me a kind look. Finally, I forced myself to speak. We were hiking. My voice sounded hoarse from screaming. My friends and me. There was something out there. It attacked us. Pete's eyebrows knit together. What do you mean something? A bear? A mountain lion? I don't know. I started, but then something occurred to me. I remembered the feeling of its claws sinking into my skin and that black fur covering its shoulders. And those eyes, those pure black orbs. Wait, I think... My voice faltered. I think it might have been a hide behind. Pete looked at me for a long moment before asking me to explain. I told him the whole story, the trip into the woods, bear acting strange, the growling in the trees, the dilapidated cabin, and the creature itself. Pete listened intently, his expression growing more somber with each word. When I finished, he sat back in his chair, a hand stroking his beard thoughtfully. He told me that he'd grown up hearing stories from his dad and his grandfather about the hide-behinds. They were shadowy figures, ancient creatures said to exist deep in the old-growth forests. They hunted in the shadows, able to move unseen. Most people dismiss the stories as just that, old campfire tales to spook kids. But Pete, he'd always had a feeling there was more to it. I couldn't believe it. Hide behinds? Was that really what that thing was? It sounded insane, and yet, it was the only explanation that made sense. We talked into the night. Pete told me about another incident that had happened a few years back. A couple of hikers disappeared in those same woods I'd been in. It was never solved, just another unsolved missing persons case in southern Oregon. Finally, with the sun beginning to lighten the sky, Pete convinced me to let him call the sheriff. Two deputies showed up a little while later, skeptical at first until they took one look at my shredded clothes, my bloodied scratches, and my haunted eyes. The next few days were a blur. The deputies launched a search and rescue operation, combing the woods with search dogs. They found Elias and Tilly, both in bad shape, but alive. Brecken, they never found him. I don't know if they found the creature either. The deputies said there were tracks near the clearing where we'd holed up in the cabin. Huge tracks, unlike any animal they'd ever encountered. But no other trace. The news crews flocked to our town, hungry for the story. Survivors recount terrifying animal attack, the headlines read. Sure, technically true, I guess. 
but the word animal just didn't sit right with me. We stuck to our stories about a bear attack, or a rogue cougar gone rabid, something people could understand, even if none of us believed it. The truth was too horrifying, too fantastical. As for me, I don't think I'll ever really recover. There are nights I wake up in a cold sweat, convinced I can hear that throaty growl just outside my window. I keep a knife by my bedside now, just in case. The town eventually quieted down. But out there, in those old, dense forests of the Siskius, I know the truth is lurking. They say hide-behinds always come back for those they've marked. Sometimes, I think it's only a matter of time until it finds me again. I remember last summer. I was driving cross-country from San Diego to visit my cousin, Eden, who moved to this little town in Maine called Havenbrook. Figured a road trip would be a hell of a lot more interesting than a flight. The thing about those remote towns is that they have this whole different kind of, I dunno, vibe to them. Like time gets a little warped, and it feels like anything could happen. My second evening at Eden's place, we're having a couple beers on his back porch, talking about his new job at the factory outside town when I hear this god-awful caterwauling coming from the woods. It's one of them high-pitched, shrill screeches that just sends a shiver down your spine. Eden looks at me, all casual-like. Don't worry, that's just old Scritch. That name gets my attention. Scritch? I ask. Is that like an owl or something? He laughs. An owl? No way. Nobody knows for sure what Scritch is. My pops used to tell me stories about him when I was a kid, said he was a wicked creature that lived out in those woods. Course, I figured it was just to keep me from wandering off. Right. I say, not totally convinced. I figure it's just another local tale meant to scare the youngsters. Then again, that sound wasn't coming from any animal I ever heard of. A few days go by, and things are pretty chill. Eden and I work on a few projects around the house, hit the local bar, pretty normal stuff. I almost forget all about that weird scritch thing until one night. We need to run down to the 24-hour supermarket on the edge of town. It's about a 15-minute drive and the road winds through a chunk of the woods. We're rolling along, listening to some old rock, when a flash of movement catches my eye. Hey, EDS, I say. Brake lights! He slams on the brakes and the old truck screeches to a halt. It takes a second for my eyes to adjust to the headlights cutting through the darkness ahead. Right out in the middle of the road, there's this hulking thing. Now, I've seen some weird animals in the desert— but nothing like this. It's standing on two legs, easily seven feet tall and skinny as a rake. Its skin looks like rough gray bark, and its head. I swear it looks almost upside down. The eyes are weighed down by what I think was its chin, and above them is this huge gaping hole of a mouth rimmed with jagged needle-like teeth. It's frozen in the headlights like a deer, its eyes glowing a weird, luminescent blue. I'm pretty sure Eden's as freaked out as I am because all he does is whisper, Sweet Jesus. It makes this sound, a cross between a hiss and a snarl, and lunges towards the truck. Drive! Drive! I yell, snapping Eden out of his stupor. He slams the truck into reverse spinning us around on the gravel shoulder as the creature slams into the passenger side door. I swear, its claws rip through the metal-like paper. Back up on the road, Eden floors it, sending dirt flying behind us. In the rearview mirror, I see that thing standing there, glowing eyes still fixed on us. It lets out another inhuman screech just before the trees swallow it up. 
Once we're back on his street, my hands are shaking so much I can barely get the key out of the ignition. We sit there in the truck trying to catch our breath. What the hell was that? I stammer. Scritch, Eden answers, dead serious. Suddenly, his bedtime stories don't seem so innocent. I never believed it myself until tonight. So what do we do? Call the cops? I say, but I already know how dumb that sounds. Eden stares down the long, dark road. It's gone now. Cops won't believe anything we say. They'd write us off as a couple of drunks. But what if there's more? I ask. Or what if it goes after someone else? He thinks for a moment. You know, the lumberjacks out in the logging camps... They talk about strange things in the woods out there. Maybe I could make some calls, ask if they've seen anything. That's when we come up with a plan. Whatever that thing was, we can't just sit and wait for it to come back. The next morning, Eden goes to work, and I run to the local sporting goods store. I figure we'll need some serious firepower if we're going after that creature. I'd buy Eden a rifle and the heaviest hunting ammo they've got, and I snagged myself an axe. It might not be much against that thing's claws, but it's the best I can manage. That night we gear up. Eden, he's not scared, but he's serious, not the same laid-back guy I knew. We pile into his truck, armed to the teeth, and drive towards the stretch of road where we saw the damn thing. The deeper into the woods we go, the denser the darkness feels. It's closing in around us, and every rustle of leaves sounds like footsteps. That night, we didn't find Scritch. We never really ventured out that far again. Not after we checked in on old Billy Thompson. Billy lives at the edge of town, his cabin right up against the woods. He was a former logger, knew those woods better than anyone. We figured if anyone could tell us anything, it'd be him. Found his place completely torn apart. Furniture was smashed, windows broken, and there was blood, a lot of blood. The walls were scored with deep gouges, like something huge had been trying to claw its way inside. Whatever did that to Billy's cabin, it wasn't an animal I knew about, no bear or anything like that. The marks were all wrong, too high up. When we saw those, something clicked inside both of us. This was bigger than just that one night out on the road. Maybe this scratch thing was more than a local legend. But whatever it was, it was dangerous. We never found out what happened to Billy. Eden and I didn't talk much about it after that. I left Havenbrook a few days later and finished the drive up the coast. You know, sometimes I wish I never heard Eden's stories about Scritch. Wish I could just chalk up that night to seeing a trick of the light or some poor deformed animal. But then I think about the look in Eden's eyes, how scared he was. Think about those damn blue eyes glowing in the dark, Billy's empty cabin, and well, it makes the drive home a hell of a lot less lonely, if you know what I mean. I live in Charleston, South Carolina, and I've been here since I was born. Never saw myself living anywhere else. The vibe here is just too good, you know? We've got that southern charm blended with beaches and warm weather. Honestly, it doesn't get much better. Well, it didn't until this past week. Stuff just got weird, plain and simple. It started Monday afternoon. I was driving home from work down on Highway 17 when something dashed into the road right in front of me. I swerved, missed it by the skin of my teeth, but slammed into one of those old mossy oak trees flanking the road. Busted up my headlight and left a souvenir dent on my fender, but hey, at least I was alive. Now, here's where it gets strange. 
No deer, no squirrel, nothing in the road. I even got out to check if maybe the critter was hurt. Nothing except tire marks and a growing sense of unease. I drove the rest of the way home with my eyes glued to the rearview mirror and a knot of fear in my stomach. Turns out, that wasn't the only accident that day. My buddy, Kellen, told me about it over beers the next night. His neighbor, old man Jenkins, supposedly swore he saw a wild boar near that same stretch of Highway 17. Jenkins is a bit of an eccentric, loves his moonshine a little too much, so I didn't think much of it. Besides, wild boars? In Charleston? Didn't seem too likely. Things kept getting weirder, though. On Wednesday, Sarah, the girl at the coffee shop, told me her little dog went missing near the marsh the night before. She was heartbroken, poor thing. I felt bad for her, but hey, animals disappear sometimes, especially in the swampier parts of town. Then on Thursday, things took a real dark turn. I was walking home from the bar with Kellen and our friend, Taishan. It was near midnight, and we probably had a couple too many. We were taking a shortcut through Waterfront Park, the one with all those old cannons and the pineapple fountain. That's when we heard it. A growl. Low and guttural, not something you want to hear in a place known for its strolling tourists and horse-drawn carriages. We stopped in our tracks and listened. There it was again, a sort of raggedest snarl laced with hunger. Sounded like it was coming from behind the bushes on the pier. That ain't no dog, Kellen whispered, and I could see a bead of sweat roll down his forehead. I'll confess, I was none too brave myself. Still, something about that sound, primal and wrong, sent shivers down my spine. Then, just like that, it quieted. We stood frozen for what felt like forever. My heart was thumping so loud I thought it'd drown out any sound the creature might make. When nothing else happened, we finally started shuffling towards the exit. Yo, that was creepy as hell. I finally managed. Don't I know it? Taishan muttered, glancing nervously towards the pier. Y'all wanna grab a taxi the rest of the way? Nobody argued. The next morning, we woke up to the news. Someone had been found dead down by the park. The details were sketchy, but it was ugly, brutal. Police were talking about a possible animal attack, but that seemed ridiculous. Sure, you get alligators and stuff in South Carolina, but this was downtown Charleston. Nothing like that had ever happened here before. Ever since then, the whole town has been on edge. There's an unofficial curfew after dark, kinda like after a hurricane. My neighbors have organized a watch, and they say there have been increased sightings of something strange near the marshes. I don't blame them for being scared, but I don't believe in some mythical beast stalking Charleston. Even so, I'll admit, I've started looking twice over my shoulder before I venture outside. Maybe those old ghost stories have more truth to them than you'd believe. Last night, I couldn't sleep. The image of that shredded body on the news, the primal growling echoing in my ears, it was all too much. I got up, sat on my back porch, and tried to calm myself down. That's when I saw it. Movement in the shadows near the marsh, maybe a hundred yards from my house. At first, I couldn't make out anything, just a silhouette shifting in the moonlight. But then it stepped closer. It was big, and walked on two legs, but not like a man. Its limbs were long and bent at odd angles, and as it lumbered out of the darkness, I swear I saw a muzzle. The thing must have sensed me staring because it stopped turned slightly, and damn if I didn't see two eyes reflecting the moonlight. They didn't look like any animal I'd ever seen. They were too, well, too intelligent. Like I was being judged, then dismissed. 
It turned back towards the marsh and padded soundlessly away, swallowed by the darkness. I sat frozen on my porch, my mind racing. What the hell was that? Had I just imagined it? Was it some kind of escaped zoo animal, or something? I needed answers. This morning, I went over to Kellen's place. He's one of the few folks around with hunting experience, and I figured he could help me track this thing down. Are you crazy? He said when I told him what I'd seen. Whatever's out there, it ain't natural. I scoffed. Come on, man. I saw it with my own two eyes. It might be dangerous, but it's still got to be flesh and blood. To my surprise, he shook his head. Look, I've been doing some reading online. There's old stories, legends down here, about something called a rugaru or a lugaru. It's some kind of shape-shifting swamp monster, a werewolf-type thing. You're kidding, right? I laughed, but it came out more nervous than amused. He shrugged. Hey, I don't believe in superstitious stuff either, but man, something weird is going on, and I don't know what other explanation to latch onto. We've been brainstorming all afternoon. The police were clearly out of their depth and with the way people were disappearing, we couldn't just sit around and wait. We figured it was time to take matters into our own hands. Kellen grabbed his hunting rifle and a duffel bag full of gear, while I snagged a couple of old flashlights and my dad's old pistol for good measure. Tonight, we're heading out to the marshes. We're gonna track down this creature and put a stop to whatever it's been up to. I'm not gonna lie, I'm more than a little terrified, but there are people out there in danger, maybe even Sarah. Something has to be done. We're meeting up with Taishan and his cousin, a marine who just got back in town. He's a tough dude, and we figured extra backup wouldn't hurt. It's almost sundown, so I better get moving. I don't know what we'll find out there, or if we'll even come back at all. But right now, I feel that familiar knot of fear settle in my chest, and beneath it, a flicker of something else, determination. This thing terrorized my city. It's time to make it pay. We headed out under the cover of darkness, flashlights cutting through the thick marsh mist. It was eerily still, the only sound the rustling grass as we waded deeper into the swamp. The air was thick with the damp smell of mud and decay, and the mosquitoes were out for blood. I tried to ignore the bugs and focus on the task at hand. It was slow going. The terrain was rough, with hidden roots and swamp pools waiting to trip up an unwary traveler. Taishan and his cousin, Malik, took the lead, their military training evident in their precise movements. Kellen and I followed scanning the darkness with our flashlights. I tried to swallow past the fear rising in my throat. It felt like we were walking right into the belly of the beast. After what felt like forever, Kellen held up a fist, signaling us to stop. He crouched down, pointing to a patch of disturbed mud. Tracks, he whispered. Big ones. My heart hammered in my chest. This was it. The creature was real, and we were getting closer. I felt a surge of adrenaline mixed with a creeping sense of dread. We followed the trail, our flashlights sweeping back and forth across the dense undergrowth. The tracks led us towards an old, abandoned shack near the edge of the marsh. It looked spooky, the kind of place you'd expect to find in a horror movie. Kellen gestured towards the door with his rifle. With a silent nod, Malik took position on one side, while Taishan covered the other. Kellen kicked the door open, and I rushed in behind him, my flashlight beam trembling. The place was empty, except for dust and cobwebs. It smelled musty, with an underlying scent of something, rotten. I wrinkled my nose. Nothing here, 
I said, my voice barely above a whisper. But then I heard it. A low, guttural growl from somewhere above. My blood ran cold. We weren't alone. I held my breath, straining to hear, my flashlight darting around the room. A shape dropped down from the rafters, landing with a heavy thud in the middle of the room. The creature. I froze, my flashlight beam illuminating it. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen. Tall and hunched over, with skin like old leather stretched over its bones. Its eyes gleamed in the darkness, filled with a predatory hunger. Fangs protruded from its muzzle, and its hands, or paws, were tipped with razor-sharp claws. It looked like something out of a nightmare. Before I could react, the thing sprang forward, a blur of motion. I yelled as pain tore through my shoulder. I stumbled back, clutching my arm. I could feel blood, warm and thick, dripping down my sleeve. The next moments were a blur. Kellen and Malik started firing their rifle rounds, filling the small space with deafening noise and the stench of gunpowder. The creature howled and dodged, its movements inhumanly quick. Then, Taishan shouted and leaped forward, swinging my father's pistol like a club. The gun connected with the creature's head with a sickening thud. It stumbled then hissed, burying its fangs at Taishan. This time, Kellen didn't hesitate. His rifle barked, and the bullet tore into the thing's chest. It shuddered then collapsed to the floor, its eyes dimming. I slumped against the wall, breath rasping in my chest. I could see blood, bright red against the dusty floorboards. But it wasn't mine. Taishan lay sprawled nearby, his face pale. A dark spot spread across his shirt. Kellen and Malik rushed to his side. I crawled over too, my legs barely able to hold me up. No, no, I choked out. Taishan, hang in there, man. But it was no use. The light was fading from his eyes and his breaths were shallow and ragged. Kellen pressed his hand against Taishan's chest, trying in vain to stop the bleeding. After a moment that stretched for an eternity, Taishan exhaled, and his body went still. Grief hit me like a physical blow. I stared at Taishan, unable to process what had just happened. He was gone. We came here to save our town and lost one of our own. Malik's voice cut through my days. We need to get out of here. There might be more of those things. He was right. As much as it pained me, we couldn't stay. Kellen and I heaved Taishan's body up, and we stumbled out of that nightmare shack and into the muddy night. By the time we reached the edge of the marsh, the first rays of dawn were painting the sky. We carried Taishan's body back to town, a somber procession illuminated by the soft morning light. The adrenaline was wearing off, leaving me feeling hollow and exhausted. My shoulder throbbed, a constant reminder of the brutal encounter. News of our discovery spread quickly. The police were baffled, but nobody could deny the evidence anymore. The creature we battled, whatever it was, people began calling it a chantico. Some ancient, forgotten spirit from the swamplands. Taishan was given a hero's funeral. The whole town turned out, a mix of grief and gratitude hanging heavy in the air. The attack stopped, at least for now. Charleston is forever changed. There's a lingering fear, a knowledge that the darkness holds secrets we might never fully comprehend. My shoulder healed, but the scars remain, a physical reminder of a night I'll never forget. I lived near Phoenix, Arizona, for five years before I moved away for college. Even though it's basically one giant suburb, 
there's still a surprising amount of untouched desert. A lot of folks like to use it for hiking, camping, and the sort of ATV action that gives environmentalists a panic attack. I even knew a couple of guys in my dorm who were into exploring the network of old mines in the hills. Me, personally? Never was much of an outdoors guy. I stuck to video games, bad action movies, and the occasional house party, same as any other freshman. But that year, my best bud was all about taking advantage of the scenery. His name was Ewan, always dragging me off for a quick jaunt or two. Check out a cool spot he'd found. Most of the time, it was just dusty, sunbaked rocks. Nice view of the freeway and all that, but hardly worth ditching my PS4. Then, a few weeks back, Ewan came knocking at my dorm door, a wild look in his eyes. I figured, here we go, another amazing vista or whatever. But this time, he sounded serious. Dude, Arden, I think I found something. Something big. I'm not even sure what it is. Some kind of cave up in the superstitions. But get this, there's old carvings all over the walls. It's gotta be, like, ancient or something. Despite my skeptical nature, his excitement was infectious. Plus, I figured it might beat another weekend of reruns and greasy pizza. So, bright and early that Saturday, we packed up his beat-up jeep and rattled out towards Apache Junction. Ewan refused to give me more details in the car. Said he didn't want to spoil the surprise. All he'd say was to be ready for a hike. The trailhead he guided me to was definitely more off the beaten path than our usual hangouts. No dusty parking lot or signs. Honestly, you could call it barely a trail. We were scrambling up a steep slope before I finally gave in. All right, Ewan, spill it. What makes this place so hot? He grinned, adjusting the straps on his overstuffed backpack. Well, heard any local legends about lost gold mines, ancient civilizations, stuff like that? Sure, I said, rolling my eyes. But who actually believes that crap? Ewan just shrugged with a sly grin. See for yourself. Hours later, sweating and more than a little grumpy, I finally understood. We'd followed the twisting trail through a maze of narrow washes, the sheer walls rising up to block the sun. And then, suddenly, the canyon opened up into a small grotto. In the back wall, a gaping hole in the rock, a cave entrance, dark and cool. Markings adorned the stone, geometric shapes, strange stick figures, and patterns that made my eyes hurt if I looked too long. There was a stale, closed in smell, like old dirt and something faintly metallic. Holy crap! I managed to squeak out. I wasn't the archaeology nerd type, but even I could tell this wasn't a Boy Scout graffiti project. Ewan was beside himself, snapping pictures like a man-man. Told you this was epic. Come on, we're going in. Before I could protest, he'd already vanished into the gloom with a triumphant whoop. I took a deep breath, the stale air tickling my nose, and reluctantly followed behind. The tunnel was uneven, barely tall enough to stand up straight in. Ewan's voice came back to me, bouncing off the walls. It's huge in here. Like a whole network. Hey, Arden, can you hurry up? A stab of unease hit me. Even if this place was genuine, who knew what was lurking in those shadows? Spiders, snakes, worse, you hear plenty of stories out here. Just when I was considering bailing, we rounded a curve into a wide chamber, faintly lit by a hole in the ceiling far above. And that's when I saw the stacks. Piled high against the walls and spilling across the floor were heaps of something. My first thought was bones, bleached white by time and sun. 
But no, way too big for deer or javelina. Cow maybe? I inch closer, that weird metallic scent growing stronger. My stomach lurched violently. These weren't bones. They were old clothing. Sunbleached scraps of denim, leather, and flannel. Some piles even held tattered backpacks and camping gear. Oh, this is bad, I whispered. This is real bad. Ewan stood beside me, strangely quiet. I could see his fingers twitching, the same jittery excitement that got him in trouble back home. Missing hikers, he breathed. Dude, think of the story. This could make us. My voice cut through his ramblings, harsh and panicked. We need to get out of here. Now. Like, call the cops right now. He opened his mouth to argue, then did a double take. My expression must have mirrored the horror I felt churning up inside me. And then a noise split the silence. A scraping sound from the dark tunnel we'd come from. Dry and rhythmic, like something heavy being dragged over the stone. My blood ran cold, a scream bubbling up in my throat. We didn't talk. We ran. The tunnel seemed to stretch on forever. Ewan fumbled for his phone, then cursed. No signal, damn it! I didn't bother looking back. My mind conjured up all the desert horror stories I'd scoffed at. Mutated miners, vengeful spirits, or hell, maybe just some psycho with a bone to pick. It didn't really matter what was chasing us, only that it was gaining. That rasping... Shuffling noise was getting closer with every desperate step. I could almost feel its breath on my neck, foul and hot. And that metallic stench? It clung to the air with every gasping breath I took. We burst out of the cave, sunlight stabbing my eyes. No time for relief. I sprinted for the jeep, fumbling with my keys as Ewan yelled for me to hurry. He was still a few steps behind. Just as I got the door flung open, he yelped. I spun around, but I was too late. A shape surged from the shadows. Tall, and possibly so. Lean and wiry, not human at all. Its long arms whipped out, skeletal fingers snatching at Ewan's backpack. I saw its face for a sickening instant, sunken eyes burning green in a hairless skull-like head. Ewan screamed, a raw, animal sound. He fought back, kicking and twisting, but its grip was like iron. It dragged him shrieking towards the darkness. I scrambled into the jeep, engine roaring to life, and then I saw something that chilled me more than any monster. The creature didn't pull him down the tunnel. It lifted him, straight up, effortlessly. I watched Ewan flail against the sunlit mouth of the cave. His screams echoed off the canyon walls. And then, with a sickening twist, both noise and movement stopped. The cave entrance stood empty against the piercing blue sky. I slammed the jeep into gear, the tires spinning and spewing gravel. My hands shook violently on the wheel as I steered wildly down the rough trail. My mind was a blur of terror and the echoes of Ewan's screams. I had no idea where I was going. All I knew was that I had to get out of there, anywhere but here. Cell reception was spotty at the best of times, and my frantic attempts to call 911 only resulted in frustrating static. Finally, back on the main road, I spotted a roadside diner. Screeching to a stop, I bolted inside, leaving the car running, keys still in the ignition. The place was a time capsule right out of the 70s dingy booths, checkered linoleum, and the smell of stale coffee hanging heavy in the air. A few truckers gave me the side eye as I slumped into a booth, chest heaving. A waitress, well past her prime, sauntered over. Pen poised, bored expression. I mumbled something about a phone. Probably came out more like a choked sob. 
Without a word, she just pointed a nicotine-stained finger towards a rotary dial phone near the restroom. I didn't even try to order anything. Figured the image of a crazed college kid hyperventilating at the counter wasn't the greatest for business. Shaking, I dialed 911. My voice, when it finally emerged, cracked and squeaked. The dispatcher's calm tone was like a lifeline in the storm of my panic. I told them everything, the cave, the piles of stuff, my friend, the thing that took him. The words rushed out of me, desperate to be believed. Because if they thought I was crazy, or on drugs, who knows what would happen? I knew how it sounded, but I had to try. They sent out a team, of course. Took hours, what with the remote location and all. They searched the area, the cave, the canyon, found nothing. No trace of you in, no evidence of the creature. Nothing but my half-wrecked jeep. I sat for hours in the back of the cruiser. It was all standard procedure. Questions, the same questions over and over. Name? Birthday? Address? Did I see anything? Describe the suspect? And then, finally, disbelief in their tone. Can you describe anything unusual about your friend's behavior? Any history of mental illness? Drug use? The shame was the worst part. It wasn't their fault. They were just doing their job. But facing the raised eyebrows, hearing that unspoken assumption, it gnawed away at me worse than the fear. By nightfall, the search was called off. I rode home with one of the deputies, a young guy, barely older than me. He didn't say much just offered a bottle of water and a grunt of sympathy when my stomach lurched on the bumpy road. The aftermath? Well, that's where it gets more complicated. They put out an alert for you in. Standard missing person stuff. I didn't stick around long enough to see how that turned out. After my statement, I felt it was best to get as much distance between myself and the superstitions as possible. Dropped out of school, packed up my stuff, and hightailed it back home. And the nightmares? Yeah, those stayed with me for a long, long time. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw that skull face, those glowing eyes, Ewan's body dangling limply in its grip. Some nights, the creature was in my bedroom, watching me from the corner. Other nights, I was back in the cave, its raspy breath on my neck, the darkness closing in. It took years of therapy and medication to even begin to make the dreams fade. Still, sometimes, when I'm hiking alone, or the sun sets at a certain angle, I catch a glimpse of something tall and spindly moving at the edge of my vision. Now, I don't know what that thing was. Some folks around those parts claim there's old Apache legends about a shape-shifting skinwalker thing. The Nahuatl, they call it. Others swear blind it's leftover experiments from some secret government research base. Me? I figure it doesn't really matter what you name it. Fact is, there are things out there that we don't understand. Things beyond the streetlights and the cell towers. And some lessons? They are learned the hard way. Back in 2018, I went hiking with my buddies, Ezekiel and Thaddeus, through the Green Mountain National Forest up in Vermont. People always say Vermont is some quaint place, full of maple syrup and BNBS but there's a whole lot of untouched wilderness up there. We weren't those city slicker hiker types. Thaddeus was a park ranger, Ezekiel grew up hunting, and I, well, I just like being outside more than inside. Anyway, we were aiming for a multi-day hike on this mostly abandoned trail called the Devil's Run. Now, from the get-go, that trail name should have been a red flag. But young guys like us always think stuff like that is just to scare off the tourists. 
First day was fine, mostly just thick woods and the occasional creek crossing. We were making good time, so we pushed ourselves to get further than we originally planned. Finally, at dusk, we found a clearing and decided to call it a night. Thaddeus set up his little tent like a pro while Ezekiel and I gathered firewood. I remember joking with Ezekiel. Hope that trail name isn't about any actual devils lurking around, haha. But he kinda got this half-serious look on his face. Turns out, there are these old legends about some creature out there. The native tribes way back when called it the Hivernant, something about it hibernating in the mountains and only waking when it got hungry. Ezekiel didn't seem to fully believe it, more like it was a campfire story he heard once. We cooked some food, told stories, the usual. After a while, the woods got real quiet, that unnatural kind of silent. And I swear, I felt like something was watching us from the tree line. I didn't say nothing, but Ezekiel looked a bit uneasy too. When I went to take a leak, every snap of a twig made me jump. Night came and we zipped ourselves in. It was one of those pitch-black nights, no moon to speak of. I was just drifting off when I heard it, scratching, coming from right outside the tent. At first I thought a raccoon or something, but this was rhythmic, like something with hands. My heart was slamming against my ribs. Ezekiel hissed next to me. You hear that, Riker? I whispered back. Uh-huh, any guesses on what cuddly creature makes that sound? Nope. He sounded real tense. Then we heard a thud, something heavy bumping against the side of the tent. I yelped and Ezekiel swore. It started circling, those scratching sounds getting faster. Whatever it was, it was big sniffing and pushing at the taut fabric. Now this wasn't some flimsy backpacking tent, but still, hearing whatever was outside getting agitated was purely terrifying. Thaddeus, voice shaking a bit, whispered, Think it smells our food? Maybe, I whispered back. Ezekiel, think you can reach your rifle? Ezekiel was silent for a moment then. Yeah, but I ain't firing unless I know what I'm aiming at. The thing outside suddenly slammed into the tent again. We all yelled, scrambling backwards. I heard a sound like ripping fabric, then a blast of freezing air. We were exposed. Ezekiel fumbled for his flashlight and flicked it on. There, crouched just outside the tear in the tent, was the most messed up thing I've ever seen. It looked sort of human-shaped, but tall and skinny all over, like it ain't never had a good meal. Its skin was pasty white, almost see-through, and its head, it was bald, with this long snout. Its eyes, that's what got me, pitch-black holes, somehow empty and burning all at once. For a second, we all just froze. It tilted its head, curious, then hissed showing these rows of way too many teeth. Thaddeus whimpered, and that must have set the thing off. It launched into the tent, all claws and teeth. I remember screaming, Ezekiel shouting, then the sound of the rifle firing, deafening in the small tent. There was this horrible stench, and then, silence. I blinked dazed, and saw the creature laying sprawled in the dirt. Still as can be, with a neat hole right between its beady eyes. Ezekiel, panting heavily, lowered the rifle. Well, guess we're adding that to the campfire stories. If we survive this, I said weakly, staring down at the creature. Think there's more? Thaddeus looked nauseous, his face pale under the flashlight beam. Honestly, I don't want to know. Just then... We heard something from the woods beyond our little clearing, another hiss. Then another, answering the first. My blood ran cold. There wasn't just one. Ezekiel and I stared at those echoing hisses, 
the flashlight beams shaking in our hands. Thaddeus had curled up in a ball, muttering something about needing to call his mom. Not gonna lie, part of me felt the same way. Then, that primal part of my brain took over. We weren't going to die cowering in this shredded tent. Thad, I hiss, get the fire going. Ezekiel, on me. Thaddeus stumbled up, sniffling, but bless him, he got a spark going and soon had a small blaze crackling. Ezekiel moved in sync with me. We snatched up those sleeping bags, ripped out the reflective lining, and used branches to make torches. Yeah, dumb movie move, maybe, but desperate times, right? The second we stepped out of the tent, the hisses got louder, the darkness seemed to writhe. I saw at least three more pairs of those glowing eyes watching us. We charge, I said to Ezekiel, voice barely a whisper. Spread out, confuse the bastards. He gave a shaky nod, that crazy hunting instinct kicking in. On three we charged, screaming like lunatics and waving our makeshift torches. For a moment, the creatures seemed taken aback. We even managed to sweat at one, feeling rough hide under our blows. But they were fast, scuttling around us, going for our legs. I felt teeth sink into my calf and cried out. Swung my torch around and heard a satisfying yelp of pain. The creature I hit must have stumbled into the fire, because there was an awful shriek and the smell of burning hair. Chaos all around. Thaddeus was yelling, Ezekiel was swearing up a storm. Then, a different kind of scream cut through the night. High-pitched and terrified. I whirled around to see Thaddeus on the ground. One of those creatures crouched on his chest, mouth wide open. Ezekiel was sprinting towards them, but he wouldn't make it in time. Fueled by pure rage, I ran slamming my torch into the side of that spindly monster. It screeched and rolled off Thaddeus, but it was already too late. His throat, it was gone, blood spraying everywhere. I dropped to my knees. Thad, Thad, no! I choked. There was no coming back from that. Ezekiel was frozen beside me, the light from his torch bouncing off his wide eyes. Then a rustling. The creatures were circling back, emboldened by blood. Our torches were sputtering out, the fire dying down. We were surrounded. We gotta run, Ezekiel said through gritted teeth, dragging me up. They'll pick us off if we stay. I stumbled after him. No idea where we were going just away from those gleaming eyes and the sharp smell of blood mingling with pine needles. We crashed through the forest, branches whacking our faces, thorns tearing at our clothes. Every rustle made us jump, thinking it was them on our heels. Then Ezekiel tripped, falling hard. He howled, clutching his ankle. I think it's broken, dude, I can't. Get up! I roared, hauling him onto his good leg. Couldn't leave him, not like this, not after Thaddeus. We had to stick together. Somehow, fueled by adrenaline and desperation, we limped on. I spotted a flicker of light through the trees, a road. We burst out, ragged and bloody, into the pale dawn light. Flagged down the first truck that passed, some old farmer who looked like he'd seen a ghost when we staggered out of the woods. The rest is a blur. Explaining to park rangers and cops, that look of pity and disbelief all mixed together. They never found any trace of the creatures, just poor Thaddeus's remains. No one quite believed our story, but hell, hardly believed it myself some days. They call the attacks a bear or a mountain lion gone rogue. But me, Ezekiel, we know what we saw out there. Sometimes, at night, I still hear those hisses in my dreams, smell that burnt hair stink. We both got scars from that night, on the outside and the inside. 
Nowadays, I stick to well-lit city streets. Thank you very much. And if anyone says the name, Hivernant, around me, well, you wouldn't recognize me from the way I run in the opposite direction. I still live on that land outside of Prescott, Arizona. Bought the place with my brother Elian when we first got out of the army. I ain't never been superstitious, but man, those were some weird times. I don't like talking about it much. Makes me sound crazy. But I guess anyone might sound crazy after what we went through. It began with the dreams. At first, it was just a feeling of being watched that prickling on the back of your neck. Then I'd see this figure, tall and spindly, just standing in the darkness, right at the edge of my vision. I'd blink, try to focus, but it would vanish like smoke. I chalked it up to stress. We'd had a hell of a time overseas, seen things that still gave me nightmares. Then the livestock started disappearing. First a chicken, then one of Elian's goats. We figured a coyote or maybe a mountain lion got them, so we reinforced the fencing and set traps. Didn't help. Things kept going missing, sometimes in broad daylight. It was around then that the smell started. This rotting sweet stench that would just roll over the property like a thick fog. Elian called it the smell of death. He'd get all pale, shaking like he had a fever made me think he was losing his mind along with those damn goats. But one morning, we found the carcass. It wasn't any critter I'd ever seen. All twisted and mangled, like something had squeezed the life out of it. I swear, the bones were bent backward, the skin almost inside out. Elian vomited right then and there. We started patrolling the property, armed to the teeth. Figured if something big was hunting our animals, we were next. Nights were the worst. There'd be sounds out in the desert, scraping, clicking, and sometimes this weird, whistling moan. Elian thought it was a bird. I wasn't so sure. Birds don't have teeth like that. Remember that one dry spell we had a few years back? Well, that's when things got really bad. I was repairing the barn roof when I saw it. Just this flash of movement out of the corner of my eye. Then this godawful screech pierced the air, and something huge swooped down. It landed on the far side of the property, and even from a distance, I knew this wasn't any bird. It was the size of a man, all long, knobby limbs and a head that looked wrong like someone squashed an owl and stretched it over a goat's skull. Feathers, yeah, but black as oil, and its eyes, those eyes burned like hot coals. Before I could get a shot off, it sprinted towards the tree line. That thing was freakishly fast, all jerky, twitching movements like a spider. Then Elian emerged from the woods, shotgun in hand. He'd heard the noise and came running. Did you see that, Van? He was wide-eyed, breath coming in ragged gasps. Yeah. I gripped my rifle. We ain't alone out here. And we weren't. It started stalking us, just lurking. I'd catch it peering through the windows at night, hear it chittering and scratching at our doors. We barely slept, always on edge, shotguns by our beds. Then came the fire. Somehow it set one of the outbuildings ablaze. I don't know how, just one minute it was fine, then BM, an inferno. We managed to put it out before the main house caught, but it was close. Elian was convinced that thing did it. It wants us to leave, he kept saying. It wants this land. This ain't natural, Van. Maybe he was right. Things had escalated too far to be random. We started packing. Plan was to sell the place cheap, get out of there as fast as humanly possible. 
but we didn't make it. Elian, he always liked to take his hunting dog, Rusty, for a final walk before bed. Just to clear his head, he said. That night, I had a bad feeling. I begged him to stay inside, but he just smiled, patted my shoulder, said don't worry. Should have listened to my gut. I heard the screams, and the barking turned into these awful yelps. By the time I got my rifle and ran outside, it was too late. Found Rusty. Well, I don't want to describe it. Let's just say, it was a worse sight than that first twisted carcass. An alien was gone. Just vanished into the darkness. Something snapped in me, I think. Part fear, part rage. I chased after that shrieking shadow firing blindly into the night. Don't know if I hit it. I chased it all the way into the canyons, screaming myself hoarse. Then it turned on me. God, I'll never forget that sight it rising out of the shadows, taller than any man had a right to be, those burning eyes fixed on me. The creature lunged, and a blur of black feathers and talons was all I saw before it slammed into me. Pain exploded in my chest, hot and searing. I staggered backward, rifle clattering from my numb hands. I tasted blood, a coppery tang in my mouth. It roared, this bone-chilling rasp that seemed to vibrate through the air. And for a split second, in the stark light of the moon, I saw its face up close. The too wide mouth, the beak-like nose dripping with, was that my blood? It pounced again, and I stumbled to the ground, a ragged breath escaping me. Claws raked across my face, barely missing my eyes. Blind panic surged through me, fueling a desperate burst of strength. I rolled, scrambled to my feet, and managed to grab the discarded rifle. It felt like a lifetime passed as I fumbled with the bolt action, trying to chamber around. The creature stalked toward me, head tilted, those burning eyes watching my every move. Come on, come on, I muttered, fingers trembling. The click of the round loading seemed deafening in the silence of the canyon. It hissed, a low, menacing growl. Then, in a blur, it rushed me. I raised the rifle, instincts taking over. Aimed for the center of its twisted body. And I fired. The thunderous gunshot echoed through the night. The creature faltered. A choked shriek tore from its gaping maw. I didn't hesitate. I fired again and again. Each shot sent it staggering, and then it crumpled to the ground in a heap of black feathers, twitching and jerking. Silence descended, broken only by my ragged breaths and the pounding of my heart. Slowly, cautiously, I approached the creature. It lay there, unmoving, wings splayed out at odd angles. It was dead. And it wasn't an owl. Up close, it was even more grotesque. The body was emaciated, the skin stretched tight over bone, almost translucent. Its legs were impossibly long, ending in sharp, curved talons. But it was the head that grotesque mockery of an owl face, the blood-streaked beak, and those eyes still burning with an eerie red glow even in death. I turned away, bow rising in my throat. A primal scream wanted to tear its way from my lungs, but I choked it back. Instead, I stumbled back to the house, rifle clutched in my hand. Morning came, and with it, the sheriff and a couple of deputies— they found Rusty's mangled remains in the canyon, not far from the creature's body. The sheriff, old Jim, he gave me a long, scrutinizing look, but thankfully didn't ask too many questions. We hauled that thing out into the desert sun, and it started to shrivel. By midday, it looked almost mummified. Jim arranged to have it discreetly picked up by some folks from the university said they specialized in strange critter cases. He patted my shoulder, told me to take care of myself, 
and then they were gone. It took weeks to sell the property. I got far less than it was worth, but I didn't care. I just needed to get out of there. Needed to leave that nightmare behind. Packed up my truck, with nothing but the clothes on my back and the rifle. Hit the road, and I haven't looked back. Settled up in Oregon now, on a small farm far from any desert. Work the land, keep my head down, and try to rebuild some semblance of a normal life. Most days it works. Most days I can push the memories down deep, where they belong. I can pretend I'm just another guy, working the land and raising my animals. But some nights, some nights I hear those clicking, scraping sounds again. Or I smell that rot-sweet stench that clings like a curse. And sometimes, I swear I see a tall, shadowy figure with burning eyes flicker across my field just at dusk. Each time, my sleep shatters, and I lie there sweating, rifle under my pillow, waiting for the dawn. I don't know what that thing was. Maybe something ancient, something that belonged to a time before men. Or maybe it was just a freak of nature, some mutated beast born from the poisoned heart of the desert. Whatever it was, the locals around those parts had a name for it, the Skin Stealer. Did it want our land? Our livestock? Our lives? I guess I'll never know. All I know is that I survived. And that some monsters, they don't just live in the darkness. Some of them, they walk right there in the light of day. I just have to tell someone about last week's hunting trip in northern Montana. It was the biggest mess you could imagine. Seriously, I'm never going back out there, especially not with those idiots. My buddy, Cade, had been going on about this remote spot for months, swearing it was crawling with elk and that we were guaranteed the best possible haul. Since the hunting season was closing soon, I caved and joined him along with his brother, Ryland. Now, let me tell you, the whole drive I felt like something wasn't quite right. The landscape was so empty. You'd drive for miles without even seeing another car. That feeling, the gnawing in my gut, just got worse when we finally hit the trailhead. We were miles from a paved road. The first two days weren't so bad. We set up a rough camp, did some hiking, but saw nothing in the way of game. I'll admit, that's part of hunting. Sometimes it's boring, and that's how it was, until the night when everything went to hell. Around midnight, I wake up to rustling outside the tent. Cade nudges me and whispers, Did you hear that? We both lay still, straining our ears. I hear it again, branches snapping, and something that sounds like breathing. Big, heavy breaths, not the kind any animal I know would make. You don't think a bear, right? Cade asks, his voice barely a whisper now. My instincts say no. Bears usually rustle around, looking for food, not whatever was stalking our tent. Before I can even answer, Ryland lets out the loudest, most obnoxious snore I've ever heard. In the silence that follows... We hear it again. Something growls, a guttural, primal sound that freezes me to the bone. It's close, just on the other side of the tent fabric. Gun! Cade hisses, shoving his rifle toward me. I fumble with the safety with shaking hands. Then, the creature outside lets out a piercing shriek that sends goosebumps down my arms. What the hell is that thing? I practically choke out the words. Cade doesn't answer, just pushes the barrel of the gun through the tent flap with a shaking hand. We can hear it circling, snarling and growling with terrifying intensity. Should I shoot? I say, my voice coming out as just a squeak. Cade doesn't respond, but his breathing is ragged and quick. 
another shriek splits the night. We could see the creature's shadow through the tent, a towering, hulking form, moving with an unnatural quickness. Then, without warning, the whole tent lurches as something massive slams into the side. I lose my grip on the gun and we huddle together, hearts pounding like they'll break out of our ribs. The creature doesn't just knock the tent over, it tears into the flimsy fabric. The screeching is even more deafening close up, and a wave of something foul washes over us like rotten meat left out in the sun. Then I get my first look at it. The starlight gives me just enough light to make out its shape as it tears through the tent. Its bipedal walks upright like a man but far too tall, with long, bony limbs that seem to bend backward. Its head is twisted sideways at an impossible angle and its eyes, even in the faint light, glow like hot coals. Cade fumbles with his flashlight and flicks it on just as the creature swipes a clawed hand at him. He ducks and the beam of light washes over it, revealing skin that looks stretched and thin, almost translucent. Through it, I can see things moving under the surface. Things that aren't bones. I can see them wriggling, like a nest of snakes beneath its flesh. The thing lets out another ear-splitting screech and bolts into the darkness with shocking speed. We're left in the wreckage of our tent, the adrenaline pumping through me so hard I feel like I'm gonna puke. Oh my god! Oh my god! Brylan starts muttering, now awake, and it sounds like he's on the verge of panic. We have to get out of here, Cade says, his voice surprisingly steady for what we just saw. Grab whatever you can carry now. With trembling hands, we gather the essentials, flashlights, rifles, knives, and whatever warm gear we could salvage from the wrecked tent. The whole time I felt like I was being watched, the air thick with that rancid, dead smell. Cade makes the call that we head back toward the trailhead, hoping to find his truck before dawn. We stumble through that pitch-black forest, my heart trying to jump out of my chest at every snap of a twig or rustling of leaves. Every few minutes, I shine the flashlight behind us, catching glimpses of those burning eyes in the trees. It follows us, stalking from the shadows. We stick to that plan, navigating by the thin sliver of a moon. We don't stop, except for quick water breaks, barely even daring to speak. I picture that creature lurking in the shadows, its long limbs stretching, reaching for us with claws that could tear us apart in seconds. Then, as the first hint of dawn starts to break, we reach the clearing where we left Cade's truck. It sits there, battered and scraped, but my heart soars at the sight. Thank God, I breathe out, and the feeling is echoed by the others. Cade rushes for the driver's door scrabbling for his keys. Come on, he hisses, flinging the door open. We have to get the hell out of here. The engine roars to life, and then the truck lurches forward. I glance back over my shoulder as we speed down the narrow track leading back to the main road, but see nothing except the dark trees flashing by. Still, that feeling of being watched doesn't disappear. We drive for hours, stopping only for quick gas station breaks. By the time we finally make it back to town, the sun is high in the sky and some of that creeping terror has lessened. We pull up to the first diner we stumble across and pile out, legs shaking with exhaustion and lingering fear. Well, that was something. Cade manages a weak laugh. I'm never stepping foot in the woods again. Ryland, still pale and shaken, just nods in agreement. I look around, half expecting to see that creature perched on the rooftop, staring at us with its fiery eyes, but the diner bustles with normal life, families eating pancakes, truckers grabbing coffee. It feels like stepping into another world after the horror of the night. We order enough food to feed a small army, and as we eat, the natural instinct to talk through what happened kicks in. 
theories run wild, from a mutated bear to some kind of escaped zoo animal. But none of those explanations fully fit with what we saw, what we heard. The rest of the day is a blur. We report what happened to the local park ranger, who listens with a polite but disbelieving look on his face. We file a police report, which feels pointless. Nobody is going to believe us, I know that. We ditch our wrecked gear at a thrift store and buy some clean clothes, trying to shed that primal fear that still clings to us. The drive home is silent for the most part. My head feels like it'll explode from the questions, the fear, and that lingering dread about what exactly lurked in the shadows last night. When I finally pull into my driveway, I feel an odd mix of relief and disappointment, relieved to be home, but disappointed that we survived, that we didn't get any solid answers as to what was hunting us. The first few nights back home, I toss and turn, jolting awake at every creak in the house, the image of that lanky, twisted creature burned into my mind. I start reading up on local wildlife, then local legends, desperate to find anything that remotely resembles what we saw. Eventually, I stumble on an old Native American folktale about a dark spirit called a skin changer. They say it prowls remote areas, drawn to fear and desperation, and hunts those foolish enough to venture into its territory. I don't know if that's the answer, if the thing that stalked us was a skin changer or something else entirely. But now, weeks later, I still check the lock on my door twice every night. I keep a loaded shotgun by my bed, just in case. And I know that even though I survived that trip, part of me is still back there in that moonlit forest, scrambling to escape a creature that defies all logic, a creature nobody will believe is real. My name's Zeldon, and you wouldn't believe me if I told you what happened last summer. We spent the month of July camping out at Lake Opiango in Ontario. My brother, Nash, and my best friend, Cecilia, were with me. You couldn't ask for better company. Cecilia's dad had this old RV he let us use, so at least we weren't roughing it in tents. Lake Opiango is a stunning part of Algonquin Provincial Park. It's massive, dotted with endless tiny islands and surrounded by thick, lush forest. Cell service is almost non-existent, which was a bonus for me, but Cecilia got fidgety at times. A couple of days in, the strangest thing happened. It was about an hour past midnight, and the fire was crackling low. The mosquitoes had been brutal, so we'd retreated into the RV. We were playing cards, listening to this old country record Nash found at a thrift shop, and just goofing around. All of a sudden, there was this sound. It wasn't like anything I could describe. A cross between a screech, a metal-on-metal -metal kind of sound, and a, well, a scream. A human scream with a weirdly metallic edge. It froze us, that sound. Even Cecilia dropped her hand of cards, the Queen of Hearts landing face up on the table. What the hell was that? Nash whispered, his eyes huge. I shrugged, but a wave of unease settled over me. We went outside, flashlights piercing the darkness, but saw nothing unusual. Just the dark expanse of the lake and the thick tree line. The sound didn't come again, and after a while we convinced ourselves that it was an animal, maybe an owl messed up on something. But deep down, I knew that wasn't right. The next few days passed mostly as normal. We fished off the dock, swam in the warm water, and roasted marshmallows over the campfire. Yet, there was a lingering tension. Whenever we'd head out alone into the woods— even just to the outhouses, any rustle of leaves had our heads snapping around. And at night, when the owls called, 
that horrible memory would flicker back. Cecilia started having trouble sleeping. She confided in me that she'd woken up twice in the middle of the night convinced something was standing outside the RV, watching her. Then came the incident with the deer hoof. We had gone for a hike, further into the woods than usual. The trees grew dense and we were losing sunlight. We were about to turn back when I saw it. A deer hoof, freshly gnawed on, laying in the middle of the path. Next to it was a tuft of fur. I'd grown up hunting with my dad, so I was no stranger to animal remains. But something about this felt off. I swear we're being watched. Cecilia hissed, glancing nervously back the way we'd come. Nash, usually so carefree, muttered that it was time to get back to camp. That night, the metallic scream came again, closer this time. The next day, the atmosphere shifted again. Cecilia was on edge, Nash unusually quiet. I tried cracking jokes, but it felt forced. We decided to spend the afternoon fishing off the dock, sticking close to the RV. We'd hardly cast our lines when there was a ruckus at the edge of the woods. A blur of brown and white shot from the tree line into the long grass near the shoreline. Cecilia screamed. Nash jumped up, nearly tipping the little fishing boat. My heart pounded in my ears. What I saw, it didn't make sense. It was like a deer on stilts. Longer legs, too high and gangly for its body. Its head was oddly shaped, elongated and tilted to one side. The eyes, that's what truly chilled my blood. They were too large for its skull, and they held a strange, knowing gleam. Before we could process it, the creature let out the same damn sound, that scream mixed with the scrape of metal, and turned, vanishing back into the trees as quickly as it appeared. I'm calling my dad, Cecilia whimpered, fumbling for her phone. No service, remember? Come on, let's get back to the RV. Nash said, gathering the fishing gear in a panic. We scrambled back, keeping our eyes pinned on the tree lean. That night, the woods seemed alive. Every crack and rustle sent a jolt of terror through us. The thing didn't appear, but I felt it was out there. We left the next morning, cutting our trip short. Something in that forest wasn't right. No wild animal moved like that cried like that. We didn't speak of it much on the drive home, a silent understanding passing between us. Cecilia's dad thought we were exaggerating, that we'd gotten spooked by a bear or something. But I know what I saw, what we all saw. And I ain't setting foot back in Algonquin Park any time soon. I always thought Backwoods, Tennessee was dull. The kind of place where you count yourself lucky if you see a squirrel with good teeth. Lived here my whole life with my brother Declan. He's the wild one, always off hunting, camping, disappearing into the woods for days. Me? I never left a ten-mile radius of the old farmhouse. Until last week. Turns out there's more to these hills than moonshine and meth labs. Way more. Enough to make me wish I'd packed more than a backpack and a lousy flashlight. Declan went missing Tuesday. He's a good hunter, so a day or two out there wasn't weird. But then a storm rolled in, one of those fast Tennessee squalls that dumps enough rain to flood a desert. I went looking. Figured he might be holed up in that old abandoned cabin he likes. It was nearly dark by the time I reached the woods. Figured, worst case, I'd stay the night in the cabin and head back at dawn. Bad call. Real bad. The storm hit like a freight train. Thunder was so loud it shook the ground. Then came this, this wailing. 
It cut through the rain and wind, just pure, raw sound, like some giant animal was hitting awful bad or getting its kill. Didn't sound like nothing I ever heard. I thought for sure Declan was dead. I sprinted for that cabin, heart in my throat. It was just a black blur against the downpour, but I made it. Slammed the door, fumbling for my flashlight in the pitch dark. That's when I saw them. Glowing. Two pinpoints of light in the darkness near the back wall. I was figuring a possum or some other varmint took shelter, but as my eyes adjusted, those lights weren't right. They were tall, like a person standing upright. And they were close. A twig snapped. I froze. Whatever it was, it was moving. The lights bobbed, drawing nearer. I backed up against the door, my flashlight trembling like those glow sticks kids break on Halloween. Then, just like that, they were gone. The storm died down, too. Silence. I didn't sleep that night. Come dawn, I hightailed it out of those woods. Back home, I grabbed my dad's old rifle. Wasn't gonna let whatever the hell that was get anywhere near Declan. I called some hunting buddies of his too, Rufus, old man Caldwell. I know they think I'm nuts, but they came anyway. That's the thing about small towns. Folks ain't gotta understand, just got to show up. We went back at nightfall, armed to the teeth. Storms cleared out, left a crisp new wash smell. I led them to the cabin. We crept inside, guns drawn. Nothing. No glowing eyes, no weird sounds. Place was empty as it ever was. I was starting to think I imagined it all. Then Rufus pointed at the floor. In the mud I tracked in, there was a footprint. It was huge, easily twice my size, and the shape, it didn't look right. Like a human foot, but distorted. The toes were way too long and thin, splayed out like a hand. Then Caldwell found something else. A piece of bloodied fur caught on a nail outside. It was dark, coarse. Didn't look like deer, coyote, nothing we got around here. My gut churned. Declan still hasn't turned up. Last night, I heard that wailing again. This time, closer to the house. Whatever it is, it's circling, getting bolder. I got the rifle loaded, but I don't know how much good it'll do. One thing's for sure, it's hunting. And if it ain't found Declan yet, I reckon it's me next on the menu. The nights that followed were hell. I barely slept, my nerves tight as piano wire. Every creak, every snap of a branch, my skin prickled and I was halfway out the door with the rifle before common sense took hold. It was watching, though, I know it. I'd see those glowing eyes at the edge of the yard, just flickering in the darkness. Rufus and Caldwell stayed over a few nights. Good men, but after seeing that footprint and hearing my story, well, they started looking at me sideways, whispering when they thought I wasn't listening. Then one morning... Rufus was gone. Just like that. Caldwell swore he heard him leaving in the night, but I knew better. Whatever's out there, it got him. Caldwell didn't last long after that. Left without a word, saying something about his grandkids needing him. Coward. I stayed. It was my mess to clean up. Nights were the worst. Daytime, it hid. Whatever it was, but under the cloak of darkness, it was bold. I'd find evidence in the morning, paw prints deeper than any dogs, strange slashes along the barn wall, like something raked its claws down the wood. Things started disappearing too, my axe, a coil of rope, hell, even my old man's boots. I got the feeling it was building something, or maybe laying traps, playing with me. I was losing my mind, that's for sure. Jumped at my own shadow half the time, 
couldn't remember what day it was anymore. Started talking to myself, to Declan, like maybe he was still close, just out of sight. It wasn't healthy, but then again, nothing about this situation was. One night, something snapped. I grabbed the rifle, a box of shells, and stumbled outside. It was a clear night, stars glittering in that way they only do out in the country. The glowing eyes were up the hill, watching as always. It was time I got a better look. I crept up that slope like some kind of half-crazed commando. Heart was rattling in my chest loud enough to wake the dead. Each step felt wrong, but I couldn't turn back. Needed to know. Needed to stop being so damn scared. I got close enough to make out its shape, and that's when my blood ran cold. It wasn't an animal, not exactly. It was hunched over like some kind of beast, but its body, all gangly and thin. The head was big, too big for its frame, and those eyes. God, like burning coals reflecting the moonlight. But the worst were its hands huge things ending in gnarled claws, longer than kitchen knives. No fur, just smooth gray skin. It didn't see me at first. Too busy clawing at a pile of branches and leaves, dragging its handiwork into a shadow tangle of trees. A nest. Building a nest right out in the open like it wasn't even worried about being caught. It's when it moved that I knew. It wasn't walking right. The legs bent weirdly, and every few steps, those awful clawed hands would brace against the ground like crutches. It was hurt, or sick, or old, something. Which made it dangerous. Desperate. More likely to kill than run. Time for me to get the hell out of there. I should have turned tail and bolted. But this, thing, it took my brother. Maybe killed Rufus. It deserved what was coming. I raised the rifle, lined up the sights. My hands were shaking but the adrenaline kicked in, steadying my aim. It turned its head then, like it sensed my intent. The glowing eyes locked onto me, and it hissed. A raw, rasping thing that sent shivers down my spine. I squeezed the trigger. The gunshot echoed through the night. The creature jerked back, letting out a blood-curdling howl unlike any I've ever heard. Then, in a blur I couldn't follow, it launched itself towards me. I fired again, blind panic making me pull the trigger wild. A shriek pierced the air, so close it hurt my ears. The smell of burnt powder hung heavy. And then, silence. Slowly, I lowered the rifle. The creature was gone. No howls, no rustling in the undergrowth. Had I hit it? I didn't know. I didn't want to find out. I stumbled back down the hill, legs weak. I left my flashlight behind, didn't need to see what horror I might have wrought. Back at the house, I barricaded myself in, collapsing onto my bed. Sleep came heavy and dreamless. That's how they found me. The cops showed up the next day tipped off by a neighboring farmer who spotted me from the road, sprawled out cold on the floor. Must have looked real convincing, a grown man huddled in the fetal position with a rifle clutched in his hands. They hauled me away, ranting and raving about monsters and creatures from the woods. A few weeks in the psych ward, and I'm starting to sound sane again. At least sane enough to lie to the doctors. They think it was stress, a breakdown after Declan went missing. They keep calling the creature a hallucination, a figment of my grief. But I saw it. I felt it. I know what's out there. They released me today. Said I'm stable, safe to return home. Should be happy, relieved. I'm not. Because they call it a whaler. Old mountain legend, they say. A spirit of the wild come to drag off those who don't respect the land. And as I drive back, 
heading to that same damn house. All I can think is, they got the name wrong. It ain't no spirit. It's real. And it's still waiting. I parked my truck by the edge of the woods near Old Pine Lake, about an hour outside of Cedar Point. Me, Brecken, and Lane Shaw were geared up for some night fishing. Okay, maybe night drinking with a side of fishing. Lane Shaw swears this place is full of giant crappy, but honestly, I just needed a break from the city grind. We found a nice sandy spot under the big oak tree and started unloading our stuff. It was already pitch black when we got there, not a star in sight and that lake was dead calm. No bugs, no wind, absolutely nothing moving, kind of eerie. But I wasn't gonna let that ruin the vibe. Damn, Nesha, where'd you hear about this little slice of paradise? Brecken cracked open a beer and grinned. My cousin used to sneak out here back in the day. She shrugged, baiting her hook. Said it ain't no regular lake. Before I could ask what she meant, something massive broke the surface of the water maybe thirty feet out. Not a splash, mind you, but a ripple that spread out slow and smooth, like a stone skipping a thousand times. Holy crap, was that a fish? Brecken stumbled a little, beer dribbling down his chin. I don't think. I mean, what the hell else could it be? I stared out at the water, heart pounding. Could have been a turtle, I guess. A big one. Lane Shaw didn't say nothing, just tossed out her line. Probably nothing, chill. We settled into it, kind of jumpy. Each time a branch cracked or something moved in the underbrush, we jerk our heads up, eyes wide. That weird feeling of being watched started to settle over me. A couple of hours later, we hadn't caught squat, but I was buzzing pretty good off the beers. When you work construction and wake up at the crack of dawn every day, a little nightcap goes a long way. I started telling some wild stories from back in high school that always get Brecken going. That's when the reeds started to move. Not like rustling in the wind, but swaying, deliberate, like something was pushing its way through. We froze. Lane Shaw turned pale, and I couldn't even crack a joke. Then we heard it. A low, almost guttural moan, right from the reeds. It wasn't an animal, at least none that I'd ever heard of. Then the reeds parted. Standing there, maybe twice the height of any man I'd ever seen, was a thing. It was hunched over, limbs all gangly and thin, too long to be right. The head was like a stag skull, all bone and antler, but warped somehow, stretched long. Two tiny, glowing pinpricks were where the eyes should be, and it just stared right at us. We gotta get out of here, Brecken whispered, his voice cracked with fear. No kidding, I muttered, already fumbling for my keys in my pocket. Lane Shaw, though, wasn't moving. Wait. She breathed. Nesha, are you crazy? I hissed, but she held up a hand, eyes still fixed on the creature. It tilted its head, and another of those moans rumbled out. Almost inquisitive? It took a shuffling step forward, and something glinted in the faint moonlight. In its long, skeletal hand, it was holding. Brecken's fishing rod the one that had toppled in earlier when we'd stumbled around after that weird ripple. I glanced at Brecken, who looked about ready to faint. It wants to give this back? Lane Shaw sounded baffled, but not scared anymore. The creature extended the rod a little further, tilting its head again. Oh my God, this ain't happening, Brecken whimpered, clutching at my arm. I looked at Lane Shaw, then back at the creature. I swear my gut told me to do it. Slowly, I reached out, our eyes locked. 
The rod was cold, slimy where it had been in the water. As I took it, the creature lowered its hand, then gave a kind of jerky bow. Without another word, it turned and melted back into the reeds. The sound slowly faded, and then, just silence again. So, uh, you catch anything? Brecken's voice was barely above a whisper. I looked down at the fishing rod in my hands. Nope. Not a damn thing, I said, trying to laugh, but the sound came out shaky. Come on, Lane Shaw said, already packing up her stuff. Let's get out of here. My cousin never mentioned nothing about no. Whatever that was. Half stumbling in the dark, we loaded everything back into the truck and hightailed it out of those woods. We didn't speak the whole drive back, not a word. And in all these months since, none of us have brought it up. Like, what can you even say about something like that? Sometimes, though, late at night... I get this nagging feeling we weren't supposed to leave Old Pine Lake that night. Like we were part of something, bigger than catching some stupid crappy. And who knows, maybe that ain't the last we'll see of that creature. Maybe someday. It was my first elk hunt in the Bighorn Mountains of Wyoming. Me, my buddy Caden, and his seasoned hunter father, Harlan. We'd been driving all night, and finally reached the trailhead near dawn on the edge of the Cloud Peak Wilderness. That part of Wyoming is remote as hell, and that feeling of being out there, miles from anyone, always gets my blood pumping. Before the sun fully rose, we were loaded up, hunting gear, food, enough supplies for a few days out in the backcountry. The trek into the woods was brutal. Thick pines, steep ground, and hardly anything like a trail. We were moving slow. Harlan called it a dam, goat path, and as the older guy, he wasn't holding back on the cussing. By the time Caden dropped his pack with a groan, and I set mine down next to his, we were all beat. Harlan, being Harlan, just gave us a disappointed look that made us feel like a couple of kindergartners. You want elk? He grumbled. You better get ready for some real work. It was early afternoon, and we set up camp in a small clearing. The old man decided we'd start our hunt then and there. He wanted to split us up, which Caden and I weren't thrilled about. Out here, it wasn't just the elk you had to watch for. There were bears, mountain lions, and other stuff better left unseen. But Harlan wanted to cover more ground, so off we went. Me and Caden were supposed to go southeast. Harlan would scout further north. Sunset. Harlan bellowed, his voice disappearing into the trees. Be back at camp by sunset. We trudged through dense forests for a while scanning for signs of elk. Tracks, droppings, scraped bark on trees, anything. After an hour, nothing. My enthusiasm was waning, but Caden seemed stoked to just be in the wilderness. He was one of those outdoorsy types, all about the experience and whatnot. Me? I kinda just wanted a big rack to show off back home. Around the time my stomach started rumbling, we found a game trail. It wound downhill, and hope glimmered in me. Elk loved trails. But the tracks we followed looked fresh, maybe even too fresh. Caden frowned while inspecting a pile of droppings. Think this is from today? he asked. I shrugged. Maybe. So? Feels wrong, he muttered, and his hand went to the hunting knife on his hip. I scoffed. Dude, chill. It's probably just deer poop. He didn't look convinced, but we kept going, the anticipation getting to me now. As we followed the trail, the trees seemed to get closer together, thicker. It was unnaturally quiet, no chirping birds, 
No rustling critters, just the crunching of our boots on pine needles. That's when I saw the first one. Just a glimpse, a flash of dark, dirty fur behind a tree trunk. I froze, instinctively raising my rifle. Easy, Caden whispered, stepping in front of me. Probably a squirrel. That made zero sense. Way too big for a squirrel. My heart was drumming in my ears. I inched forward Caden behind me. Just as I reached the tree, the thing burst out, heading straight for us. Now, I'd seen coyotes before, but this wasn't that. Bigger, for sure, and mangled-looking, patchy fur, weird hunched gait, and those eyes. God, those eyes. Not normal yellow like an animal's. These were like rotten milk. It let out a growl that was chillingly human-like, its teeth bare and dripping with something dark. I fired off a shot, more of a reflexive jerk than actual aim, but the creature yelped and veered off. It didn't run. It hopped away on three legs, disappearing deeper into the woods. In shock, my knees nearly gave out. Caden gaped at me. Holy crap, dude, what the hell was that? I don't know. I stammered, my voice shaking. But whatever it was, it wasn't right. Then we heard it. A low, groaning sound coming from further down the trail. Something big was moving towards us. This ain't natural, man. We gotta get out of here. Caden whispered, his eyes wide with a mix of awe and terror. The sun was beginning to dip below the treeling. Harlan would be expecting us back soon. But there was no way we were going further into these woods, not with whatever those things were lurking around. We didn't even discuss it. We just turned and hightailed it back, not stopping until we burst into the clearing where our camp was. The camp was wrong. Our tents were shredded. Supplies torn apart and strewn everywhere. A sickening feeling twisted in my gut, and my eyes shot towards the trees. My rifle clattered uselessly as I took in the scene. This wasn't a bear attack, not some wild animal. This was targeted, almost spiteful. Caden's face was ashen, his usual outdoors of bravado replaced with wide-eyed terror. Harlan! He choked out. That was when we heard it. A chilling scream echoed through the woods, not quite human, but close enough to turn our blood to ice. I scrambled for the radio Harlan had insisted we carry. Dad! I shouted into it, my voice cracking. Dad, answer me! Static. Nothing but harsh, garbled static. Caden's ragged breathing echoed in my ears. Had they gotten to him too? The thought nearly made me sick. We gotta find him. I mumbled more to myself than to Caden. There's gotta be some trace. I didn't need to finish. He was already stepping gingerly among the wreckage, searching. I followed. Among the mess was a scrap of fabric, torn and stained with dark red. My heart plunged to my stomach as I recognized it, a piece of Harlan's flannel shirt. The sun was disappearing behind the mountains. Whatever those things were, they were still close, circling us. There was no time for grief, no time for hesitation. Only survival. Caden, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. The truck. We gotta get to the truck. It was miles back, up the awful path we'd struggled in on, but our best bet. He nodded, his face pale but resolute. Together, he whispered, and we took off, leaving our destroyed campsite behind. Our dash through the darkening forest was a blur of adrenaline and fear. I kept imagining those milky eyes glinting at us from the shadows, those snarling, rotten teeth. The screams we heard only pushed us harder, each one like a punch to the gut. We tripped and fell countless times, 
our limbs shaking with exhaustion, but we kept going. We had to keep going. For Harlan. For ourselves. And all the while, a question began to form in the back of my mind. What the hell were we dealing with? Finally, just as the last sliver of sunlight vanished, we saw the clearing with the truck. It was a lifeline, a glimmer of hope against the suffocating darkness. We lunged towards it, scrambling into the cab and fumbling with the keys. The engine roared to life, and I stomped on the gas, tearing away from that cursed place. The headlights cut a path through the dense woods as we bumped and jostled along the trail. Every shadow seemed to writhe, every snap of a twig sounded like monstrous footfalls. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being followed. Hours later, we finally reached the outskirts of the nearest town, a tiny place called Ten Sleep. My hands were clenched so tight around the steering wheel that my knuckles ached. Rolling into town was like surfacing after being underwater for too long. There were streetlights, houses, signs of life. We stumbled out of the truck and into the first diner we found. The warmth, the smell of food, the normal chatter. It was almost overwhelming after what we'd been through. A waitress, bless her, gave us coffee and concerned stares without prying. Eventually, we called the sheriff. It was a long, rambling story, and I watched the skepticism grow on his weathered face as I spoke. We described the mangled creatures with their unnatural eyes. We told him about Harlan, about our ravaged camp, about the screams. And then I remembered the old stories. Mountain tales, told around campfires for a shiver of fear. Legends of a creature called the Howler, a twisted thing, not fully animal, that roamed the remote wilderness. Look, I told the sheriff, my voice hoarse. I don't know what those things were, but they weren't animals. They were something else. Something like the stories. He looked at me steadily, and I saw a flicker of recognition, or maybe just a flicker of pity, in his eyes. We stayed in ten sleep that night, under the watchful eye of the sheriff's department. The next day, a search and rescue team went out to the site of our camp, accompanied by armed deputies. They found nothing. No trace of Harlan, no sign of the creatures I swore I'd seen. It was ruled an animal attack, likely a cougar or bear that got spooked and tore up the camp. They never found Harlan, dead or alive. Caden and I, we went back home, shadows under our eyes and a hollowness inside us. We never spoke of it again, not to each other, not to anyone. It was too strange, too terrifying to put into words. But sometimes, at night, I still hear those inhuman screams in my nightmares. I remember those milky eyes in the darkness, and I wonder, did those things exist? Were they just a product of our fear, or were they something the world wasn't meant to know about? My name's Eldon and you wouldn't believe the crap I saw out in northern Arizona a couple of summers back. Me and my buddies, Reese and Kellen, were on a road trip, trying to squeeze in one last blast of stupidity before college started. Reese had this great uncle who left him a cabin near Flagstaff, so naturally, we decided to turn it into Party Central. Only, this wasn't some fancy lakefront property. Out there, it was all twisted pines and dry washes, the kind of place where you start to feel watched even when you're alone. Let me paint a picture for you. The cabin wasn't much to look at. It was this squat, single-story thing built from weathered cedar, a couple of sad windows facing the endless expanse of trees. Out back, there was an old fire pit that hadn't seen a flame in years and a rambling path that wound its way into the dense woods. If I'd had any sense, 
We would have turned around the moment we pulled up. But at twenty, you think you're invincible. The first night was weird. It wasn't like full-on horror movie weird, just those subtle things that make you jumpy. See, out there the silence was absolute. Like no bugs, no wind, just this heavy quiet that settled on you like a blanket. We got a fire going, cracked a few beers, and tried to ignore the creeping shadows at the edge of the light. Kellen swore he heard something moving out there a couple of times, but we figured it was deer or something. I mean, we were in a forest, nothing too crazy. Things got weirder the next day. Kellen's the outdoors type, always disappearing on hikes, so he was gone most of the afternoon. Me and Reese stayed back, planning to hit up the town for supplies when he returned. Only he never did. Sun was getting low, and there was still no sign of him. That's when the worry set in. Now, Kellen knew his way around the woods, but this place had an unsettling feel to it. We tried his cell. Straight to voicemail. About an hour later, just as we were about to head out and look for him, Reese calls out. Dude, check this out. I find him near that old path, staring off into the trees. He points to a spot about fifty yards in, and my stomach drops. There's a flash of bright color against the dull browns of the undergrowth, something that definitely doesn't belong. It's Kellen's red backpack. I thought I heard voices, Reese says, his own voice barely a whisper. That way. We edge closer, the ground littered with broken pine cones and needles under our feet. As we near the backpack, dread clenches my gut. I've got a bad feeling about this. We creep forward, and that's when we see it, a spot of bare earth, scuffed and trampled. Kellen's backpack sits in the middle, but there's no sign of him. And then there was the smell. I'll never forget it. A sickly sweet must that clogged the back of my throat, making me gag. Reese, white-faced, points to a smear on a nearby tree trunk, just above my head. It was dark, thick, and streaked down to the ground. Blood. Fresh blood. We didn't stop to think. We turned and ran. I stumbled, fell, scrambled up, the panic propelling me back towards the cabin, Reese hot on my heels. As we burst through the trees and back into the clearing, both of us slammed the cabin door shut and bolted it behind us. We stood there, panting, hearts thundering. What the hell was that? Reese gasps, leaning against the door. I shake my head, my mind racing. It was too dark now to head into town. We were stuck out there for the night, and we both knew something was lurking outside. All I could think about was that smell and the dark smear of blood. It didn't seem real, a nightmare playing out in the middle of nowhere. The woods rustled and crackled, surrounding us. We huddled around the fire pit out back, too scared to go inside. That night was endless, every sound amplified a hundred times over. It wasn't just the rustling now, there were heavy thuds, like something big moving around the cabin, snuffling and scratching. A couple of times, I heard a rasping breath against the back window. I swear it sounded almost curious. It was just before dawn that it happened. Reese had nodded off, leaning against me, and I was blinking heavily, trying to stay awake. Then I saw it. A silhouette moving at the edge of the clearing, monstrously tall and lean, like a skeletal, deformed shadow hunched in the pre-dawn light. Its head twitched towards us, and in the dim glow, I saw them, its eyes. They were huge, oval reflecting an unnatural blue in the half-light. Not animal eyes, something else entirely, intelligent and filled with an unsettling hunger. I screamed. Reese jolted awake, staring at me in confusion as I scrambled back, pointing. There! In the trees! 
Did you see it? Reese looked, scanning the tree line. See what, Eldon? It was gone, vanished back into the darkness. Reese blinks at me like I've grown a second head. Eldon, man, what the hell? Get some sleep, you're seeing things. My throat's raw. I swear, Reese, it was there huge, not like a bear or anything. And those eyes. I shudder. The image of those unnerving blue orbs burned into my memory. We huddle against the dying fire the rest of the night, taking turns in fitful half-dozes. The creature doesn't return, but the woods buzz with its absence, alive with a sense of menace that crawls under my skin. First light comes as a relief. We pack up fast, abandoning most of our gear in our haste. No way am I sticking around to find out what that thing wants. We stumble back to the car, every crackle and rustle making us jump. As I slam the door, something catches my eye, a ragged tear in the trunk's metal, like the car had been swiped with giant claws. Panic fuels me as I start the engine and throw the car into reverse. We tear out of there, barely stopping to shut the gate to the property behind us. We don't talk much on the drive, just stare ahead, trying to put as much distance between us and that place as possible. Every truck, every hitchhiker, makes us flinch. We don't stop until we hit the outskirts of Flagstaff, collapsing into a cheap, grimy motel, only then feeling safe enough to breathe. The news reports start a couple of days later. Missing hiker in the Coconino National Forest. They found his mutilated body near a campsite, the cause of death undetermined. They chalk it up to an animal attack, but I know better. It took everything in me not to call the cops, to tell them what I saw. Would they believe me? Would they even care? I imagine the laughter, the questions about how much we'd had to drink. No, better to keep my mouth shut and pretend like it was all a nightmare. But it wasn't a nightmare. News reports of similar attacks start popping up. Scattered, isolated, victims torn apart the way only something with unnatural strength could do. The papers toss around theories. Escaped zoo animal, deranged recluse. But none of it feels right. Me, I know the truth but I keep it locked away, a chilling secret I'll carry for the rest of my days. Years passed. I avoided forests like the plague, even the manicured city parks making me uneasy. The memory of that night never truly faded, but it dulled, tucked into a corner of my mind reserved for things I tried not to think about. I finished school, got a decent job, even started a family the picture of normalcy. Then a few weeks ago, I was on a work trip, flipping through channels in a bland hotel room when a news story stopped me cold. A rash of disappearances in northern Arizona, right near that godforsaken stretch of woods. They hadn't found any bodies this time, just abandoned campsites and blood-spattered trails disappearing into the forest. Authorities were baffled, locals whispering stories about an old legend their grandparents used to tell. The Skin Bearer. That was what they called it in the local legends, a shape-shifting creature, gaunt and skeletal, with eyes that glowed an unnatural blue. Some say it was a cursed spirit, others whispered about a demonic thing that lurked in the shadows. But one thing the tales agreed on, it craved only one thing human flesh— I turn off the TV, a cold sweat breaking out. It can't be a coincidence. It's back. All these years later, that thing is still out there, still hunting. And somewhere, deep down, I know it won't stop until it finishes what it started that night. I always figured myself a city person. Don't get me wrong, I love a hike now and then, the whole commune with nature kick. 
but living out in the middle of nowhere? Nah, that's not for me. I like having a bodega on my corner, not ten miles of woods. My name's Kieran, by the way. Which is why my sister thought it was absolutely hilarious when she convinced me to come get away from it all with her out at some rinky-dink cabin in the Poconos. This trip was her whole plan. Turns out our Uncle George, some guy I haven't seen since I was a toddler, passed a few months back and left this place to her. She wanted company for her first day, someone to drink beer with and complain about how terrible the Wi-Fi signal was. Think of it as a retreat, Kieran. She chirked, batting her eyelashes at me in that annoying older sister way. A chance to detox from the city. Plus, I hear the fishing is great out there. Now, I'd never been all that close with my sis, Yvette, but she's family, and I wasn't doing a whole lot else that weekend. And hey, free beer didn't sound so bad. So off we went, trekking up to the middle of rural Pennsylvania in her ancient Subaru. The cabin itself was... Well, it was a cabin. Rustic, to put it kindly. No insulation, spotty phone service the whole nine yards. Yvette seemed absolutely thrilled, chattering about renovating and bringing the place into the 21st century. I think I'd gone numb somewhere outside of Wilkes Bar. We'd taken a detour at one of those farm stands, the ones with the hand-painted signs and apples that actually look like the stuff from fairy tales. I tried one, damn tasty, I'll give him that. The next two days were a blur of dusty furniture, hauling boxes labeled Uncle George, and discovering more species of spiders than I thought possible. That evening, we sat out on the porch, the woods stretching out before us under a sky so thick with stars it made your head hurt to look at. I bet there's all sorts of critters out there, Yvette mused, taking a long pull from her beer bottle. I snorted. You want to see critters, head back to my apartment. It'd take a month to track down all those cockroaches. We laughed, and it was, I'll admit, kind of nice. I forgot, for a bit, about my phone buzzing uselessly in my pocket, how far the nearest pizza delivery was, all the ways I didn't fit in here. Day three, that's when things got off. Yvette was keen to hit one of the local trails, said it was marked as an easy hike down to a lake. Armed with bug spray and an inexplicable amount of trail mix, we ventured out. The trail itself was fine, though it got real mucky in some spots. Felt like the kind of place a person could break an ankle if they weren't careful. We heard all the usual noises, birds squawking, leaves rustling, the occasional unidentifiable snap that made me jump. But mostly it was quiet, the kind of heavy silence that makes your ears ring. We reached the lake around midday, this little sliver of murky water tucked back between the trees. It was okay. I guess if you're into scenic views. Not exactly worth the mosquito bites, if you asked me. We sat for a while anyway mostly making fun of how pretentious Yvette's water bottle looked, the kind with all the hydrate stickers and time goals printed on the side. That was when I noticed it. A faint trace of what looked like, scorch marks along one of the trees near the water's edge. Like someone had taken a lighter to the bark. Weird, but hey, maybe some idiot teen with time on their hands, right? We hadn't seen a soul all day. The mark snaked upwards a ways, then vanished abruptly. It was while I was craning my neck, trying to follow them, that I heard Yvette suck in a sharp breath. Holy crap, Kieran, look over there! She was pointing across the lake, and when I followed her gaze, I felt my stomach twist in a way that had nothing to do with that morning's gas station muffin. Half hidden among the trees on the opposite shore was a structure, or at least, what was left of one. Blackened, jagged-looking. Fire damage, maybe? But what the hell was a house doing way out here? 
Then I saw movement, dark shapes starting between the charred beams, so fast my eyes could barely keep up. I don't know how many there were, but I do know I wasn't waiting around to count them. We gotta go. We gotta go right now. I hissed at Yvette, who, for once, looked just as spooked as I felt. We tore back down the trail, any thought of the picturesque hike abandoned. I wasn't usually the panicky type, but something about those burned ruins and all that scuttling had set my teeth on edge. Halfway back, we ran into Mrs. Kravitz. No, seriously, that was her name. She lived in the neighboring cabin, the closest thing to a local we'd found out here. Round lady in a sun hat, had a real nosy vibe that reminded me of our old apartment super. Turned out this had been her neck of the woods for decades, and I figured she could give us the scoop on the fire-wrecked place. Oh, the old Fisher place? Awful shame, that was. Burned down near twenty years back. She clucked, shaking her head. You know what caused the fire? Yvette asked, always the curious one. Mrs. Kravitz leaned closer, a glint in her eye I didn't much like. Well now, the official report said faulty wiring. But folks around here, some say that old man Fisher, he got mixed up in some unsavory things. Heard it wasn't an accident, but something coming to collect what was due. She cackled then, like it was all a punchline, but my mind was whirling. That didn't sound right. And what about the movement in the ruins? Squatters? Animals? The longer I thought about it, the less any of it made sense. You kids all right? Mrs. Kravitz squinted at us. You look like you've seen a ghost. I wanted to laugh, because, in a way, maybe we had. Or maybe something was watching us from the shadows, and I was about to become a horrifying anecdote in the next edition of Small Town Lore. We made our excuses and got back to the cabin double time, but that prickle under my skin didn't fade. We barely said a word to each other the rest of that day, and I definitely didn't sleep much that night either. At every creak of the floorboards, every hoot of an owl outside, I was picturing those dark shapes flitting across the lake, wondering what the hell they were after. I was halfway convinced we were losing our minds until morning came, and with it, a fresh sign of strangeness. When Yvette opened the cabin door, there it was, a carcass laid out on our porch, small and furry, half-eaten, like some kind of twisted welcome gift. We stared at the mangled thing, the stink of rot making my stomach turn. What the hell did that? I sputtered, my voice going a few octaves higher than usual. I don't... I don't know. Yvette finally responded, her face pale. She crouched down, gingerly examining the carcass. Then I watched her expression change from confusion, to disgust, to dawning horror. Wait, I think it's a... She gagged, lurching away from the porch. Kieran, I think it's a raccoon. But look, it's legs. When I followed her gaze, I understood. The animal's hind legs didn't bend the right way. They jutted out in crooked angles, the bones showing through ragged flesh. Oh God! I choked out. My hands were shaking so badly I could barely keep my phone steady as I snapped a few pictures. The gut feeling that we need proof warring with the urge to chuck my phone into the woods and sprint for the car. Whatever had done this was still out there, watching us from the trees, and I had zero interest in being its next plaything. We gotta get out of here, Yvette. Like right now, I said, my voice raspy with panic. But Uncle George's stuff and— She trailed off, the fight draining from her face. I grabbed her by the arm. Screw that. Cabin doesn't matter. Photos don't matter. We're leaving, and we're calling the cops. She had enough sense not to argue. We piled into the Subaru, 
peeling out of the driveway and leaving a dust cloud behind us. If there was a sign that said, Welcome to the Poconos, we missed it in our rush. I didn't bother trying to explain to Yvette why we couldn't stop and call for help. With every mile we drove, my mind raced, that carcass, the burnt house, and whatever it was that kept lurking at the edge of my vision. We pulled over at the first rest stop we found, a dingy little place reeking of burnt coffee and those industrial strength air fresheners. Ignoring the questioning looks of the other travelers, I grabbed my phone and punched in 911 with shaking fingers. The whole thing went by in a blur, explaining our location, sputtering out a description of what we'd seen at the cabin. The operator tried to sound calm and reassuring, but I could hear the strain in her voice. This wasn't your average panicked call about a flat tire. By the time the police arrived, I was convinced we were going to land ourselves in a mental ward. Maybe this was some elaborate city folk hazing ritual. Maybe squirrels had gotten into my city water supply and driven me insane. But when Yvette showed them the photos on her phone, the carcass, those scorched trees, something in the cops' expressions shifted. They took our statements, grim-faced and efficient. Promised to dispatch someone to check out the cabin, but the whole thing felt. Like even they didn't totally believe us, but had bigger fish to fry than dealing with two traumatized siblings. One of the cops, older guy with a bushy mustache, hesitated before getting back into his cruiser. Listen, he said, if I were you, I wouldn't go back there. Something feels off about the area, you know? Maybe lay low for a while. Get your bearings back before you do anything else. Yvette shot me a worried look. I knew she wanted to press for more, demand they haul us back there with a SWAT team, but something told me that wasn't going to happen. We thanked them, piled back into her car, and drove until we hit a town big enough to have a couple of crummy motels. That night, we lay in the stale motel room, curtains drawn tight despite the flickering neon sign outside casting garish stripes of light across the walls. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw those shadows dancing by the lake, the way they moved all wrong, almost like they were scuttling backward on too many legs. The news reports the next day were unhelpful. Forest fire risk in the area was up so please remain vigilant. An advisory about bear sightings bears now, asking folks to keep their garbage bins secured. Nothing about mutilated animal carcasses. Nothing about mysterious figures lurking in burnout ruins. Frustration gnawed at me almost as much as the fear. We were just two more widows with a wild story, dismissed as easily as a campfire ghost tale. It was Yvette who finally broke the silence. We have to go back, she said voice steely in a way that reminded me why she was the older sis. Back? Are you insane? My voice climbed a few octaves without my permission. Not to the cabin, she clarified. To Mrs. Kravitz. She said the original owner was named Fisher, right? Maybe there's records about him, the fire, something. I hated admitting it, but she had a point. Running away wouldn't bring us any closer to answers. Whatever the hell was lurking out in those woods, it probably wasn't going anywhere. We owed it to ourselves, if not to those poor twisted-up critters, to get to the bottom of it. The drive back felt twice as long. We didn't speak much just a low hum of the radio filling the silence, punctuated by that jittery thumping in my chest that wouldn't quit. Mrs. Kravitz was watering her sunflowers when we pulled up. When she saw us, her expression crumpled from surprise to a sort of grim pity. I guess too pale, haunted-looking city slickers didn't look like they had the best of news. You heard, didn't you? She said, voice heavy. Heard what? Yvette asked, 
but her face mirrored my own unease. Mrs. Kravitz clucked her tongue, ushered us onto her porch like stray cats. She made us lemonade with way too much sugar, hands shaking as she poured. They found something this morning, out on the old Peterson Trail. A hiker, bless his soul. Looks like an animal attack, but... She trailed off, shaking her head. It ain't right. Not natural, the way. Then she started talking about the Fishers. Local legends. Whispers about old man Fisher dabbling in things he shouldn't. Stories about how the fire wasn't an accident, but something, summoned. Something he couldn't control. She called it a wicker man, told us how they were drawn to fear and desperation, feeding off it. The word struck a chord. I'd seen the movie in college, a creepy-as-hell folk horror thing with masked figures chanting around a burning effigy. But this, this was happening in my life, to my sister, to me. It was one thing when it was safely trapped on a screen, quite another when it felt so damn close. Mrs. Kravitz paused, a glint in her eye. If a summoning brought it here, maybe you can unsummon it. There's a book in my attic, an old one, spells and such. I never was much for that sort of thing, but... The rest of the afternoon dissolved into frantic research. We pored over Mrs. Kravitz's dusty book, filled with faded drawings and archaic language. Half of it sounded like superstitious nonsense, but there were hints of protective rites, ancient wards designed to banish malevolent spirits. It seemed like a long shot, but desperation makes you cling to anything resembling hope. By the time dusk fell, we'd decided. We weren't going to run anymore. We would go back to the cabin, use whatever rituals that book hinted at, see if we could put an end to this. Packing up the car felt surreal, like stepping into a warped mirror version of our arrival. I bought every flashlight the local general store had, and pocketed a rusty-looking hunting knife for good measure. It wasn't much, but it made me feel slightly less like a sacrificial lamb. The night was moonless, pitch black but for the slice of light the car headlights cut through. We found the trailhead without any trouble. This time, there was none of that quiet wonder about the woods at night. It was all rustles and looming shadows and that prickle of being watched. The fire-ravaged house by the lake stood exactly as we left it, a twisted monument to something I couldn't fathom. We kept the flashlights trained on the ruins as we set up the ritual, a hastily drawn circle of salt around the biggest tree, herbs from Mrs. Kravitz's yard scattered within, the book propped open to a tattered page of incantations. My mouth felt dry as I choked out the archaic words, the forest echoing back with each syllable. When nothing happened immediately, my heart sank. This was it. A dumb spell and a fistful of salt were supposed to combat whatever darkness we had unleashed. Then I saw it. Movement, flickering at the edges of the flashlight beams. Too many legs, segmented and twitching, scuttling across the rotting wood beams. It was them. Not one creature, but dozens, pouring out of the ruin like chittering insects. And they were coming straight for us. Fear hit me like a physical blow. Yvette screamed, stumbled backwards, and I barely lunged in time to grab her arm. Those twisted shapes were converging, their chittering reaching a fever pitch. My brain whirled, trying to process the impossible scene before me. Not animals, not bugs, something else entirely. They were segmented, chitinous legs twitching as their bulbous bodies swarmed around the half-buried bones of the Fisher house. Their heads were twisted all wrong, too many eyes glinting in the darkness. They looked like they were pieced together from bits of different creatures, all wrong angles and sickly pale flesh. Run! I shouted at Yvette, the words tearing themselves from my throat. 
We bolted back towards the tree line, the circle of salt and half-finished ritual abandoned in an instant. Panic surged through me, the adrenaline making my vision tunnel. I could hear their clicking, scrabbling legs closing in, the stench of decaying flesh making my stomach lurch. We tore through the forest, branches whipping our faces, undergrowth tearing at our legs. I risked a glance back and my blood ran cold. The things were gaining, scuttling the long branches and across the forest floor with unnatural speed. Up ahead! Yvette yelled, and I saw a flicker of light through the trees. The lake. Maybe if we could make it to the water, they wouldn't follow. It was a desperate, stupid hope, but it was the only thing keeping me moving. Behind us, the chittering grew louder, a discordant chorus that made my head pound. We burst out of the trees, the moonless lake stretching before us. Yvette went down with a cry, tripping over a half-exposed root, and I didn't see him until it was too late. A shadowed thing darted out from the undergrowth, a blur of twisted limbs and glistening fangs. It was on her in a heartbeat, a scream ripping from her throat that ended with a sickening gurgle. No! I roared, and something inside me snapped. I fumbled in my pocket for the hunting knife, a pathetic weapon against this nightmare, but all I had. Rage and blind terror gave me a burst of speed. I slammed into the creature, wrestling it off my sister. It was strong, shockingly so, chittering and snapping at me as I stabbed at it wildly. My knife skidded off chitin, but I felt it bite into something soft. Blackish blood poured down my arm, and the thing squealed in what sounded like agony. It thrashed, flinging me off, and I hit the ground hard, gasping. Yvette lay crumpled, her eyes wide with a terror that was slowly fading. Her mouth moved soundlessly, as if trying to scream. But the creature, though wounded, wasn't down. It darted in again, dragging itself along as I struggled back to my feet. I knew then it was over. We had come here for answers, and all we had found was death. But damn it, I wasn't going to die without a fight. With a primal yell, I charged headfirst, aiming for those gleaming eyes. The impact bowled me over, but I sunk my teeth into something, anything, feeling it thrash against me. There was pain, a white-hot surge through my arm, and then I was flying, tumbling end over end before crashing into the icy water of the lake. I surfaced, gasping for air that tasted of blood and dirt. Behind me, the shoreline was alive with movement, dozens of those creatures pouring out of the woods. They huddled at the water's edge, making those awful clicking noises. But they didn't follow. Stunned, battered, half-drowned, I managed to drag myself back to land. Yvette was gone. There was no sign of the creature, not even a blood trail. It was like a nightmare made flesh— leaving no proof behind. And I was alone. The police came eventually, of course. My story sounded unhinged, even to my own ears. An animal attack, they said, maybe a rabid bear, though they couldn't find any tracks that matched up. The case went unsolved, another chilling mystery in the rural Pennsylvania backwoods. I tried going back to my old life, burying those horrific memories as deep as possible, but it didn't work. People look at me weird when I check under my bed too carefully, or flinch at every nighttime sound coming from my apartment building's fire escape. They don't get it. They didn't see the way those things moved, the way they looked at us like we were walking meals. They didn't hear my sister scream. The wicker man, Mrs. Kravitz called it, though I'm starting to think old man Fisher was just a conduit for something much older, something that still lurks out there in the shadows. Sometimes, on nights when the wind whispers through the air-conditioning vents, I swear I can hear a sound, 
almost like insects skittering across my walls. Then I remember that lake, the twisted shadows swarming out of the burned house, and my knife still stained with that strange black blood. Maybe, just maybe, a part of that darkness followed me out of those woods. Maybe there are things older and more terrible than we understand, lurking just out of sight. Or maybe I'm just crazy. I don't know which is worse sometimes. The not knowing, that's the thing that really gets you. Makes me wonder, are they still out there, those things with too many legs? Are they still calling them the Gricklebacks? I guess I'll find out eventually. We all do. Okay, listen, I gotta tell you this. Last summer, I went on this solo backcountry trek through the Ozarks. My buddy, Kay Bryson, was supposed to come, but he bailed last minute. I should have known better, that flaky jerk. Anyway, I'm the type that needs to get out of the city now and again, breathe a little fresh air, you know? Always have been. First day, it's all good. Hiked a good ten miles, saw the best dang sunset of my life. Set up camp near this little creek, cooked myself some grub, did the whole outdoors a thing. It's my second night that gets weird. See, I always sleep with the rain fly just half on, kinda like looking up at the stars. So, I'm half dreaming, feeling this icy chill, not a breeze, mind you, a localized chill like something cold is right next to me. I opened my eyes, and let me tell you, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. Just outside the tent, maybe two feet away, is this thing. Tall, easily seven feet, but hunched over like its bones are too long for its skin. Its head, I can't even describe it properly. Big and flat, like someone had stepped on a pumpkin with these beady eyes sunk way back under a bony ridge. But the worst part was the skin. Pallid, stretched tight across its frame, almost translucent, like you could see every sinew and vein underneath. This thing was just wrong, like something out of a nightmare. I froze, hardly daring to breathe. It tilted its head, and I swear those eyes were looking right at me. It sniffed the air, this wet, raspy sound that made my stomach turn, and for a heart-stopping second, I thought it was gonna come right into the tent. Instead, it let out this whistling shriek, a sound that cut through the night like a rusty knife. It startled the hell out of me, and I must have jerked or something, because it took a shuffling step back, then turned and bolted into the woods, disappearing like a damn ghost. I lay there, shaking in my sleeping bag, trying to convince myself it was just a dream. But I knew it wasn't. The next morning, I found footprints. Huge, misshapen things, nothing like any animal I'd ever seen. That's when I knew I had to get out of there. I packed up faster than I ever thought possible, heart pounding the whole time, imagining that freak creeping around the trees, watching me. Now I spent the rest of that trip constantly glancing over my shoulder. Never slept right. Kept expecting to see that pale face peering at me from the darkness, to hear that inhuman shriek again. Finally, I hightailed it back to my truck a day early, cutting the trip short. I didn't care. The weirdest thing is, no one believed me. I showed them pictures of the footprints, told them about the thing and they all just gave me this pitying look, like I'd gone nuts out in the woods. Even Cade, when I finally got hold of him, just laughed it off, said I probably saw a deformed deer or something. Makes you start to question yourself a bit. But that didn't make the memory of it go away. See, it wasn't just the way the thing looked, it was that feeling of wrongness, of something straight up unnatural being just inches from me. That feeling is still there, a prickle at the back of my mind. 
I haven't been back to the Ozarks since. Hell, I barely sleep out in the backyard anymore. Couple of weeks ago, I was scrolling those missing person websites, the ones with blurry photos of folks who vanished on hikes. Guess what I saw? A report from near where I'd been camping, way up in the backcountry. Guy named Elisa Esguerra, experienced outdoorsman, just disappeared. No trace. I looked at that picture, at his dark, serious face, and I just knew. Whatever took him, it was the same thing I saw that night. Maybe he wasn't so lucky. I started doing some digging, and you wouldn't believe the amount of old Ozark legends there are whispering about weird creatures lurking in those woods. Tall, spindly things, pale as death, snatching people out of the dark, things the old-timers used to call hide-behinds. Makes a chill run down your spine, doesn't it? So here's the thing, I told myself I wouldn't go back. But there's this nagging part of me that just won't shut up. On one hand, I'm scared as hell of seeing that thing again, or worse, becoming another blurry missing persons photo. But on the other hand, if there's even a sliver of a chance of stopping that thing, of finding out what the hell it is or getting some shred of proof, hell, I might just have to give that trail another go. Problem is, I can't do it alone. Not again. And you wouldn't believe the looks I get when I start talking about hide-behinds to folks. So that's where I'm at now, stuck. I get this panicked feeling rising, like I'm out of time. I hear a rustling outside. It's probably just a squirrel. But that sense of dread is back, that feeling of eyes on me. I grab my flashlight, heart beating like a drum, and flick the beam out into the darkness. For a split second... I think I see a flash of sickly white skin, something slithering behind my tool shed. I stand there, flashlight beam trembling, but there's nothing but shadows behind the shed. I lower the light, take a deep breath, and force myself to start thinking clearly. Whatever that thing is, it's gone for now. Logic says I should pack up and drive home, tell myself I'm crazy, forget this whole thing but I can't. I think about Ulysses, and something hardens inside me. The next couple of days are a blur. I get myself a shotgun, you know, the kind you see in the movies, the one that makes that satisfying chunk-chunk sound when you load it. Some ammo, a better flashlight, stuff I didn't think I'd ever need back in the city. I find an old army buddy, Marcus, who owes me a big favor. He doesn't question too much when I tell him I'm going back into those woods, just fixes me with that steady ex-military stare and says he's got my back. We head back to the Ozarks, set up camp at my old spot. Marcus swears I'm nuts, but he helps me rig some motion-activated cameras around the perimeter. The rest of that first day is excruciating. Waiting, knowing every rustle of leaves and snap of a twig could be it. Marcus is on edge, but he's not seeing what I saw, doesn't have that feeling crawling on his skin. I start to doubt myself, questioning if I actually saw anything real out there at all. Night falls. We eat a tense dinner by the fire, Marcus trying to crack jokes while I can't seem to swallow. It's when we're washing up the dishes that it happens. The motion cameras start flashing like crazy, and I hear that terrible, whistling shriek again, louder this time, closer. Marcus and I exchange a look, pure terror mixed with grim determination. We both grab guns, scanning the woods with our flashlights. Then we see it. The thing steps out from the trees, not ten feet from our camp. Its eyes shine in the light, those awful hollow eyes filled with a predatory hunger. It hisses, bearing long, yellowed teeth, spittle dripping from its inhuman mouth. Sweet baby Jesus! Marcus breathes out, his voice barely a whisper. Remember what we talked about? I tell him, 
trying to keep my own voice steady. We agreed, gotta aim for the head, that's the only shot we might have. The thing starts to circle us, moving impossibly fast. Marcus and I, back to back, rotate with it, trying to keep it in our sights. It bobs and weaves, impossibly agile for something of its size. Suddenly it lunges toward Marcus. I fire on instinct, the shotgun blast roaring in the still night air. Buckshot tears into the thing, and it emits a shriek that sounds like a human scream cut short. It stumbles, and I see a bloom of blood, no, some kind of dark ichor, splattering the trees. Damn, I didn't hit the head. The thing turns toward me, rage twisting its mangled features. It's wounded, but still dangerous. It charges, and I fire again and again. The recoil slams against my shoulder, and the air is thick with gunpowder and that sickly sweet, metallic smell. I see more of that black blood flying and then, darkness. It collapses just a couple feet in front of me, its shuddering body finally going still. Marcus and I stare down at it in the mingled flashlight beams. It's dead, and in the harsh light, we can finally see it clearly make sense of its unsettling shape. The skin is a mottled gray, tough and leathery, stretched over protruding bones. The face, the face is flat with sunken eye sockets and a gaping maw lined with needle-like teeth. I feel a wave of nausea, but under that is something like triumph. We freaking did it. But the thing, it's not the creature I saw that first night. Yes, it's similar, has those same impossible proportions, but this one is smaller, less, potent. And that's when it hits me. The thing from the other night, the one I think took Ulysses, that one was bigger. I tell Marcus my theory. He just lets out a low whistle. So, the legend's real, he says, his face grim. The whole damn nest of them. The aftermath is a blur. Call the rangers, report a dangerous animal killed in self-defense, lots of questions, and disbelief. We show them the body, what's left of it after the wild critters start digging in. Word gets around the locals, the story spreads. Folks start calling these things long walkers, which seems as good a name as any. Some hunters take to the woods, braver or more foolhardy than me muttering about thinning down the herd. Me, I'm done with those damn dark woods. But sometimes at night, I still think I feel those hollow eyes on me that prickle down my spine. And I wonder, somewhere out there in the Ozarks, maybe in the deepest, most forgotten corners, is there a long walker even bigger, even more terrifying, just waiting? My name's Eldon, and I live in a cabin I built myself outside a tiny town called Willow Creek, nestled deep in Vermont's mountains. Yeah, kinda cliché, the whole, off-the-grid, thing. Honestly, it wasn't about philosophy, it was about the property prices. Anyway, that September, I was splitting wood with my buddy Kian, before the worst freeze of winter set in. Dude, you hear that? Kian asked, the head of his splitting maul lifted. His usually goofy grin was replaced with a confused grimace. Hear what? I glanced up, listening. The wind, sighing through the trees, was a familiar sound. Same with the occasional caw of a crow circling overhead. Sounds like chanting? I dunno. He shrugged, bringing the maul down hard on a stubborn log. I rolled my eyes. You've been watching too many of those weird documentaries, man. Kian grinned, nudging me. Hey, keeps things interesting during long Vermont winters. We worked in companionable silence for a while. I wasn't the superstitious type, but after my ex left, 
The isolation out here could play tricks on my mind. Maybe that's what was happening to Kian. Then it came again. Not chanting this time, but a kind of rhythmic, thudding. It was offbeat, almost rhythmic. Uneasy, I dropped my axe. Do you hear that now? I asked Kian. He was already standing stock still, squinting into the trees. Yeah, what the hell is that? Sounds like it's coming from down by the creek. Kian gestured vaguely downhill. Stay here, I'll check it out. I said, feeling like it was my duty since it was my property. I didn't like the tremor in my own voice. Eldon, maybe we should just dash. Kian started, but I was already jogging away, grabbing my hunting rifle from the cabin porch on the fly. The woods were thick, and the rhythmic thuds, intermingled with rustling leaves and wind, were hard to follow. I almost tripped over a fallen log and swore, slowing down. Whatever it was, it wasn't moving fast. When I reached the creek bed, the noises grew clearer. Two or three distinct, heavy thumps followed by a dragging sound, then it repeated. Hello? Anyone there? I called out, keeping the rifle raised. No answer, just those damn disjointed thuds closer now. With a pounding heart, I rounded a bend in the creek. My breath hitched. There was a clearing ahead, and on the far side was something. I froze, trying to comprehend what I was seeing. It was massive, easily twice as tall as a man, hunched over a deer carcass. Fur, impossibly long and black, hung mangy from its bony frame, obscuring its face. Jesus! I breathed, slowly backing away. Each of its ungainly movements produced those grotesque thuds. My mind raced. Was it a bear, maybe? But no bear was that big, that skeletal. Then it lifted its head, and what I saw made me fumble the rifle. It wasn't a bear snout that emerged, but a horrifying parody of a human face stretched taut across a flat skull. Small, milky eyes blinked, and black saliva dripped from elongated teeth. It was utterly wrong, an abomination against nature. My brain stuttered, trying to find any reference point. Was it something from local legend? A deranged hermit? Some mutated animal? Nothing fit. It took several steps, and my body finally kicked in. I whirled around, rifle clutched in sweaty hands, and ran. Behind me, I heard a sound like nothing I'd ever heard before, a wheezing howl laced with an eerie, almost human glee. Twigs snapped, and I risked a glance over my shoulder. It was gaining on me with alarming speed despite its awkward frame. I pushed harder, lungs burning, heart ready to burst. The woods ahead blurred into green and brown, my panic gasps the only sound in my ears. Just when it seemed my legs might give out, I saw the edge of my clearing. Kian stood there, splitting axe raised like a frozen warrior. His yell broke through the haze of terror. Eldon, what the hell is Dash? His voice cut off as the beast came lumbering from the tree line. Its long arms stretched out towards him, those horrific teeth. Kian didn't even look confused anymore, just stark white terror. I don't blame him, the thing was a nightmare made flesh. Gone! I yelled, knowing it was a foolish hope that the shock probably left him frozen. It shambled towards Kian, a jerky, unstoppable movement. There was no time. I raised the rifle and aimed for its center of mass the best I could. The first shot cracked the air, and the creature staggered back, for singed with a puff of smoke. A guttural screech echoed off the trees. Kian, jolted from his stupor, finally dropped the axe and turned to flee. He wasn't fast enough. The beast lunged, impossibly agile for such a lanky frame. Kian screamed, cut off as those massive, 
dirty claws raked his back. Blood arced like crimson ribbons through the air. He stumbled and fell, but somehow he was still scrabbling forward, leaving a grotesque trail behind him. I fired twice more, the echoes deafening after the silence of the woods. Each of my shots hit it, but it didn't slow down, just seemed to rage harder. I was running out of time. Dropping the rifle, I sprinted forward, bellowing a wordless animalistic cry in a voice I barely recognized as my own. The thing turned from Kien and swiped a claw at me. I managed to dodge the first blow, but the second caught me on the arm. Pain seared up to my shoulder. I hit the ground hard, gasping. Through blurry vision, I saw the creature loom over me. It leaned closer, those milky eyes fixated, the rancid, coppery smell of its breath making me heave. I was about to die just like Kian, just like that poor, ravaged deer. Something sharp sparked in my brain, a desperate survival instinct. With a roar that felt ripped from my gut, I scrambled backwards, kicking at the thing's leg. My boot thudded hard against bone. It screeched again higher pitched, and reared back with that uncanny echo of human pain. Kian lay a few feet away, still alive but barely. Eldon, the cabin! He gasped, choking on blood. Then a flicker of movement in the tree line caught my eye. A woman, of all things, dressed in forest ranger gear emerged, brandishing a shotgun. I'd heard there were a few stationed in the area— but help felt like it had arrived a lifetime too late. Get back! she yelled. The creature took one threatening step towards her, and she fired with a bone-shaking boom. It staggered but didn't fall. She fired again, this time aiming for its head. The skull exploded in a spray of black gore. The thing thrashed and then collapsed, its inhuman screams fading into bubbling rasping breaths. It became still, mercifully still. I slumped back, breath coming in harsh sobs. It was over, but my hands trembled. The ranger hurried to Kian, but it was clear one glance was enough. Her expression when she turned back to me was a mix of horror and grim pity. I wasn't arrested despite everything. The aftermath was a blur of statements, interviews, and then nauseating condolences for Kian's family. My cabin seemed tainted now, and I didn't know if I could stay. The whole town knew my name, whispered words like, Creature, and Monster, followed me. They called it the Goat Stalker, something dredged up from forgotten local folklore. Sometimes, in those restless nights haunted by Kian's screams and that thing's eyes, I think maybe that woman wasn't a ranger at all. Locals had stories about something guarding these woods, an old spirit taking vengeance on those who harmed the land. Who knows, maybe there was some truth to those old tales after all, and maybe it was the only thing that saved me. I spent quite a bit of time last weekend in Helen. You've probably heard of it, that little Bavarian wannabe town nestled up in the mountains. I know, not exactly a thriller writer's hotspot, right? But see, the thing about Helen is it's kitschy. Like over the top, Oompa Band and every other restaurant, Cuckoo Clocks for Days, kitschy. That can be fun, but it's also off somehow. You ever get that vibe? Like something's just a bit too perfect to be real. But hey, I wasn't there to analyze the cultural significance of Lederhosen, okay? My buddy Xerxes, yeah, I know, his parents were into it, had invited me up. Said he'd scored this cabin in the woods dirt cheap. Something about the owner needing it gone, fast and hush-hush. Figured worst-case scenario. It'd be a boring weekend with beer and bad horror films. Turns out, sometimes you really are the cliché. 
We rolled up Friday night, Xerxes with his usual duffel of who knows what, me just trying not to trip over tree roots in the dark. The cabin was, well, a cabin. Less. Quaint retreat. More. Barely standing against the Georgia pines. But hey, the porch was wide, and X had brought the good bourbon, so I figured it was a net positive. Saturday, we hit the hiking trails. It was a beauty of a day. That crisp, early fall air that makes you want to do outdoors a stuff you'll regret later. Xerxes, true to form, was in full wilderness mode. Branch identification, fungus lecturing, dude was a regular David Attenborough after a six-pack. The weirdness started around mile three. First, it was a faint rustling. Not unusual. I figured it was a squirrel or something. But whenever I paused, it stopped. And it just didn't sound right. Too big. Plus, every so often, I'd catch a whiff of something awful. Like rogue killed that's been baking in the sun for way too long. Xerxes claimed he didn't smell a thing, but I was definitely getting the heebie-jeebies by then. Then, well, I saw it. Just a flash out of the corner of my eye. Something huge, like bear-sized, bounding through the trees. Except, not quite right. The way it moved, too jerky, too quick. Legs were way too long. And I swear to God, the thing was almost hairless. Smooth, grayish skin glistening in the dappled light. Now, I'm not prone to flights of fancy. But damn, it freaked me out. I nudged Xerxes. He gave me that side eye he does when he thinks I'm being a dork. And it bolted back into the undergrowth. Gone in a blink. That night, over burned hot dogs and more bourbon, I tried to tell X what I saw. The dude just snorted. City boy sees his first deer, loses his mind. Whatever, I let it slide. We joked a bit more, then turned in. Big mistake. I woke to scratching. Not cute little chipmunk scratching. This was full-on nails on wood. Something wants in scratching, focused at my window. The moon was just bright enough to make out a blurry shape. Big. Hairless. The same damn thing I saw in the woods. Panic surged through me. The way it does when you're half asleep and your brain knows something seriously wrong. Scrambling for my phone, I fumbled to turn on the flashlight. The beam caught it square in the face and it, oh God, the eyes. Not like anything I'd ever seen. Too big, too close together, and glowing with this sort of sickly yellow light in the darkness. It hissed low and guttural. The sound stopped my breath cold. That's when I knew, whatever this thing was, it wasn't just some oversized critter in the wrong neighborhood. It was smart. Hell, maybe it was hunting. I flipped on the bedside lamp, trying to force myself to think straight. Xerxes snored through the whole thing. Bless his oblivious heart. I had to make a decision. Stay and risk that thing breaking through the old window? Or make a run for it down the dark trails? Either way felt like a death sentence. But then I remembered the truck. X kept a pistol under the driver's seat. I'd seen him cleaning it once, all paranoid about bears. It was a slim chance, but it was something. I crept out of the bedroom, hard hammering so hard I thought it might give me away. Each floorboard groan felt like a gunshot in the silence. The living room was bathed in that blue moonlight, everything tinged with an eerie unreality. Through the front window, I could see its shape shifting just outside the porch light's reach. Waiting. Holding my breath, I eased open the door. The cold air felt like a shock. The porch creaked under each step I took, echoing through the silent woods. Every crack of a twig made me jump, certain I'd been heard. Then, finally, I was across the yard, 
fumbling for the truck keys in the dark and I grabbed them, diving into the driver's seat and slamming the door. My hands shook violently as I fumbled to shove the key into the ignition. One twist, two, nothing. The old truck just coughed and wheezed, refusing to start. Come on, come on. That's when I saw the blood. Streaked across the passenger side window, smeared by a clawed hand. Xerxes must have woken up, seen the thing, made a break for the truck. I imagined it all in a sickening flash, him fumbling with the door handle, the thing dragging him out, maybe the screams cut short by those horrible glowing eyes. The engine roared to life, headlights piercing the darkness. I slammed the truck into reverse, barely looking back. Tires screeched on gravel as I tore out of the yard, the thing loping along in pursuit. It was unbelievably fast. With each glance in the rearview mirror, it seemed closer, its clawed hands scraping at the truck bed. The trees blurred past in a sea of green and brown. Every twist of the dirt road, every bump, felt like it might send the truck swerving into a ditch. I couldn't shake the image of Xerxes, his usual snark wiped clean by terror, whatever he saw in those last moments. A clearing loomed out of the dark. A stroke of desperate inspiration hit, the gravel pit. Maybe if I could open up the distance, lose it in the maze of old roads down there. I swerved hard, the truck nearly tipping as I careened off the trail. The gravel was loose, sending me skidding, but momentum was on my side. I glanced back just in time to see the thing clear the trees, lunging for the truck. Its long legs made it almost spider-like, the movements unnatural. That sickly sweet rot smell invaded the truck cab, almost making me gag. The gravel pit was just ahead, its sharp drop-offs like scars cut into the earth. I slammed on the brakes, the rear of the truck swinging dangerously towards the edge. Behind me, the thing shrieked in what might have been frustration. There was a flicker of those eyes, and for a second, I swear I saw something else, not animal intelligence, but something more cunning. Then it was leaping. A flying mass of muscle landing right on the hood, claws tearing at the metal. I screamed, shoving it off, but it was too strong. I felt a searing pain on my arm as those claws dug deep, raking flesh. I hammered on the gas, the truck fishtailing as I fought for control. I looked up as the edge of the drop-off loomed close and made the choice. Hitting the brakes, I jerked the wheel with all my strength, sending the truck spinning. The thing, not expecting it, went tumbling off, yelling in rage as it hit the dirt. Somehow, I kept the truck from going over the edge, but I could hear it scrabbling at the loose gravel, trying to get back up. I slammed it in drive, tires spinning as I tore off back down the network of old mine roads. My arm was on fire, vision blurring from the pain, but I didn't dare stop. I drove until sunrise, finding my way back to the main highway on pure adrenaline. After that, it's a jumble. Hospital, cops, statements that didn't make any sense. They found Xerxes' body, torn to pieces. Search parties went out, but the thing, whatever the hell it was, vanished. They chalked it up to a mountain lion attack gone wrong, but I know better. I see those eyes when I close mine, still glowing in the dark. They never named it, that creature. In the news reports, whispers in the small towns, it was just, the thing in the woods. But me? In the quiet moments, the only name that feels right is Skin Strider. Even now, the words make my blood run cold.